go. Give me the sign. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. And my apologies, our executive session went rather long this, this evening, as you can <laughs> are well aware. Um, let's open our meeting with the traditional Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. So prior to the meeting, the board met in executive session. This was to consider litigation strategy with respect to a petition of Eversource Energy to consider purchase, sale, lease, or value of real property, to discuss strategies with respect to contract negotiations, and to discuss strategies with respect um, to contract negotiations with non-union employees, as an open meeting may have detrimental effects on the bargaining positions of the board. So with apologies for the delay, uh, we will start off by opening the meeting to our usual public forum where residents are invited to share ideas or ask questions regarding town government. Is there anyone who would like to address the board tonight? Mr. Harrow, please come up. So it was probably a month ago that I came before you. It was a very busy night and I had three things I wanted to talk about and I cut it short. And so tonight it's been a very busy night and we haven't only just gotten started and I don't feel like I can talk about all three things again. So I'm gonna cut it short so you get to see me again some point. So, having said that, firstly, the thing I got to speak about the last time and there was some question and no one within the board seemed to know what I was talking about. I went to CONCOM meeting next, like I will be going next after this. And that's where I learned what it was all about, so that my source was correct. Um, and I will leave it at that because I'm sure everyone knows now about what I was talking about. Yes? Possibly. Okay, possibly. <laughs> we'll leave it go at that. And I'm not going to let the bike lanes go this time. So the bike lanes, and I will entrust you to pass those around. There's only five copies, but you can grab one if you want on the way by. The bike lanes are these wonderful things designed by DOT, and we all think they're the greatest thing since, well, not we all, greatest thing since fried bread. So those are the DOT standards for storm drains. And you'll notice two things circled in red, one of which is the gutter. And so when they're aligned with the gutter, you can tell they therefore become aligned with oh. the direction of travel. Good. You with me? You, you, you had this one other time, and Mr. Westerling fixed it for you because yes. you nearly yes. got yes. killed. Yes, 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 absolutely. Yes. I'm not complaining about Hopkinton. Yes. This is a statement about DOT. Now, if there's any question, I have 10 pictures of what happens when one is on a bicycle and the storm drains are like that. And maybe you'll be so kind as to pass those around too. So DOT clearly doesn't know what they're doing with respect to bicycle safety. If it's the latest 2017, they're saying that's how you put those storm drain grates in. Right. If one has no confidence in DOT's knowledge about bicycle safety with storm drain grates, I have no confidence in their knowledge of designing bike lanes is my point. Can I ask you, Ed, we don't have any like this in the town, do we? Or was there one or two and you identified it, Mr. Wexler? There this one I can recollect it was at Lumber and Granite Street, and within 24 hours of me pointing it out, it was fixed. Because ours are all like this. No, they're not. There are some that are parallel, and, and, and John or David, I'm sure, could point out where they are. Have you either looked at or consulted with Mr. Westerling about the plan downtown quarter um, to see what kind of, to see what their plans are and make sure that, so we can, like he can be alert that this not be put in? I mean, he's crazy. Well, my, my point here is not that they're gonna have storm drain grates like this in the middle of the bike lanes. My point is that I do not believe that DOT understands the needs of people riding bicycles. Obviously. The, any, anything you look at, and I got stuff you can look at, but we're running out of time and I don't want to use it all up. 
everything that comes out of mass DOT that shows bike lanes, the one universal thing you can count on, besides bicycles and people and trees and things like that, is they're flat. Mm -hmm. Hopkinton is not flat. Mm -hmm. On my bike, just coasting down the hill, not pedaling, starting at the bank, 17 miles an hour by the time I got to the drugstore turning. If somebody's coming down that hill at 17 miles an hour just coasting along, someone pulling out of a driveway, he's going to look right, they're going to look left, and then they're going to be looking left because that's where the traffic's coming from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And someone's going to get smacked. And I, I've said enough for now. I'll be back later. Have a good night. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Ed. Anyone else who'd like to follow it? Ed, I can tell you in about Ed. Ed. Uh, Ed. Ed. I can tell you that the town of Hopkinton, circa 1989, was well ahead of your curve here. I've been hit in the head with a shovel by Cook Cumlin more than once when we were cleaning catch basins by not putting them back in the same way. So, sweet dreams. <laughs> okay. Well, if there, if there are no other takers for our public forum, we will move on to the first item on our agenda, which is staff recognition. And the Board of Selectmen will recognize tonight DPW heavy equipment operator James Russ Lukey for his 30 years of service as of October 11, 2018, working for the town of Hopkinton. Russ, you are here. Please Hello. come up. Hello. What a wonderful Thank honor. Congratulations. <laughs> Bet the town has changed a little since you started. It certainly is. It certainly is. Bet your Brendan's changed a little since then. Huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not much. Both of us. <laughs> but, uh, well, it's, I think it's just great that you've been here with us so long. And I know your, your wife, Eileen, probably uh, shares in our um, honor in having someone who's been such a long, dedicated, faithful, uh, and effective employee. And I'm sure the job hasn't gotten any easier for you. But obviously, we're doing something right to have kept you all this time. Glad you allowed me to stay here for 30 years. We <laughs> are honored that you have. I don't mean to hog it, but are there any, any other comments for the board? We have a lovely commendation for you. It's got gold on it, but not, not 24 karat, because we are budget conscious here in town. <laughs> but board, other board members. I would like to go last. You'd like to go last. Yes. Well, who would like to go second? Anybody. <laughs> so this is celebrating 30 years of service to the town as a heavy equipment operator. Mm -hmm. But this isn't the end of 30 years of service to the town. Is it, we're not celebrating a retirement here. This you're not evening. going anywhere. Uh, I'm sorry? Yeah. I'm retiring yeah. Friday. Okay, that's what I'm not clear <gasps> about, so. Oh, <laughs> oh, that's, oh, that's not such good news. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, in that case, then it's a whole nother level of thank you it for your years. Um, uh, I, I, 30 years of service to Hopkinton's fantastic. I hope your retirement is another 30 years of fantastic service to your family and yourself. You've earned it all. And uh, we're going to miss you, and we really appreciate everything you've done for the town. So thanks for coming tonight, too. Thank you. But, uh, yeah, I thought it might be a retirement. And that's, that's, that's great, but it's also a little sad for the town, too. Yeah, I thought it was going to be like a 30-year pin, and then you're working towards, no. you're working towards 40 or something. No, <laughs> not going to happen. So did you, did, did you train somebody to take your place? Sitting in the back of the room. Beautiful. Excellent. That's what we're all doing. Tall, big shoes to fill Excellent. back yeah, there. Yeah, that's, it, cause that's, you know, that's always a hard thing for us also. You know, when we, when, when uh, the police officers retire and some of the, and, and some of the firefighters retire, you know, and, and, and we're bringing in all these, all this, this young blood and everything else. It's scary for me because it's going to be more grandkids. But, uh, but really, we appreciate 30 years hanging in with us and see, watching the town change and grow. Uh, oh, I love the new DPW facility. Love it. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much for all your thank you. help and dedication. I say thank you. I mean, it's an honor to have you here for 30 years. I think you're, uh, you're leaving right as. Whereas we got the new DPW building, it's, uh, I think that should give you a little more emphasis in sticking around a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Just to enjoy it. 
You know, my wife and I joke. pretty firm on that Friday date. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My wife and I joke about, you know, with the new marathon school, it's so beautiful. We wish, maybe we should have another kid. So we can take advantage of it. <laughs> Just throwing it out there for you. But thank you. We thank really you. appreciate you being here and uh, everything you've done for this town. Thank you. So, Russ, uh, or for the people that don't know you as Russ Spider, um, I have. Uh, <laughs> So it needs to be noted that um, Russ, is, he put 30 years in here. He put probably close to that amount of time in on the fire department. Uh, his brothers are both retired uh, town employees that have worked here for forever, and they've all retired. Uh, his grandfather started uh, Farrer's Fire Truck Company, which is now went to Murphy's, which then went to now Bulldog. So Russ is one of those fixtures in town. Um, and we're going to keep this at a PG level. Russ and I have had a lot of fun over a lot of years. Yeah. Um, but this is, a, uh, this is one of those things where the town's losing someone that worked here for 30 years, but he's, he, they're losing somebody that can drive down East Main Street and say, when there's a snowstorm coming, saying that culvert's got to be open. Because if it isn't, uh, that whole East Main Street's going to flood. So we lose a lot more than just a guy who knows how to run a loader or run a backhoe or drink a lot of coffee or, or any of that. So uh, Russ has been a, a, a very good friend of mine for a very long time. We will miss him tremendously uh, as an employee. Um, I know he doesn't live in town anymore, but um, you know I'll, I will miss the, uh, I already missed the nights at the tap, I missed the nights at the gun club. <laughs> and uh, I wish you from the bottom of my heart the best of, uh, best of times during your retirement. You've earned it, sit back and have a couple of frescas. And, Think about uh, Bud Terry while you're throwing him back. Yeah. Thank you. All right, buddy. Thank you. Congratulations. So, Rush, I guess this is bittersweet. I didn't realize your, the retirement that went with it. But um, thank you from the entire town and congratulations. And we uh, would like to present you with a certificate of appreciation. And let's take it as a photo op up here under the town, uh, town quilt. The light doesn't work, but it's on. It's on now. Okay. Testing, testing. Maybe because I pushed the button. Okay. Red is on. <laughs> okay. Um, we have two items tonight on the board's consent agenda. They are item number one, board minutes. The board will s consider approving the October 16, 2018 Board of Selectmen minutes. And item two is a parade permit. The Board of Selectmen will consider approving a parade permit from Sandy Lucchese on behalf of REMAX Executive Realty Charitable Foundation for its annual 5K road race to be held on Saturday, November 17, 2018, beginning and ending at Hopkinton Country Club. Expected number of participants, 150. And I see Sandy is here to answer any questions. Um, would anyone on the board like to pull out for individual discussion either of these items? Everybody's happy. I'll make a, I'll make a motion that we... Uh, I'll request a oh, motion then. Yeah, I'll make a motion that uh, we, we approve uh, 
the board minutes for 10, 16, 18, and uh, approve the uh, parade permit for Sandy Casey on behalf of Remax Executive Realty Charitable Foundation. Second. Okay. All right. The motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 And oppose. It is unanimous. And what am I? You are saying what? They're not. Turn his mic on. Say something, John. I'll test it again. I knew it wasn't working. Can't get it by him. Can, He's an engineer. Can we just move that? Does that is that mic live? Can we just put move that over maybe to the desk, for John? Did we vote on that? I think we did. Yeah, we voted. We did. Sandy, you're all set. What's you the problem? Can. John's mic's not working, so we'll give him a desk mic. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay. Moving along. Board and committee appointments. The Board of Selectmen will consider making the following appointments. Um, well, let's take these one at a time. Number one is the historic, oh, they're both historical commission, excuse me. Uh, two appointments to the historical commission. Christine Remby to full member position for a term expiring on June 30, 2019, and also to the Historical Commission, James Haskins to associate member position, term expiring um, June 30th, 2020. And I believe, am I correct, Mr. Kamalo, that the full position for Christine is to fill the resigned position of Ms. Dr. Yankee? Correct. Correct. Is Christine here? Christine, come up and say hi. I know Christine um, applied quite a while back, and she and Beth Watson were both um, made associate members for a while, so you've been attending the meetings and um, enjoying it? Yep, for almost a year now. It was back in December. Um, it wasn't exactly what I thought, but it turned out to be a really good experience, and I enjoy it quite a lot. So I was looking to become a full member. And my recollection, Christine, was you have some roots in Hopkinton too. You have your, uh, I remember Gert Remby, was that your grandma? Yes. So both my parents were born and raised in Hopkinton and my grandparents also lived in Hopkinton as well. So. Just out of curiosity, how was it not what you expected to be? Is that a good or a bad thing? Um, it's a good thing. I, I don't really know what I expected, but it, was an eye-opener as to how things happen in the town and <laughs> certain steps to take. So I'm really learning a lot and enjoying it. Good. Does the board have any questions? So the historical commission is town-wide. Correct. Correct. And how many members are on that board today? Well, the board is to have seven members. And as you may recall, last year when Mr. Sestari was still here, we had several very qualified applicants. We had Mr. Sonnet. We had um, Christine and we also had Beth Watson and we only had one opening and we decided to create two associate member positions because we just didn't want to lose all these qualified people. So um, Beth has recently moved into one of the full-time spots when that opened up and now a second has opened up. Um, and it's something we hadn't done before, but I think it's very nice that we offer sort of a training opportunity for people to get their feet wet and everybody try each other on for size. In this position, Christine will fill only the, the one position that's currently open for a full member, and then James would fill the only position open for an associate member, is that correct? Right. Well, there would not be another associate member right now. That's, those are both newly created positions. So Christine's position is one of the full member positions, one of the full seven. Right. So James would be And then there's two her. associates, and she's moving up, so then James is filling her spot? No, no. Well, yes, yes, excuse me, James, but I mean, there's nothing that says we have to have two associates. We simply created those two associates. And there's only and one associate right now, and would, that's today is that Christine. Christine. I got it. Okay. Slide her over and continue with another associate. Perfect, I'm all set. All right, is there a motion, please, to appoint Christine Memby, Remby as a full member of the Historical Commission? Um, it would be Dr. Yankee's uh, term, which will expire this, uh, this coming June, June 30th, 2019. With that, may I say just so moved? 
So moved. Second. Okay. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. That is unanimous. Thank you Thank for you very being much. willing to Thank step you. up, Christine. Appreciate it. And James. So now we understand what we're talking about. James would be new to the board. He would take one of those associate positions. We've talked to James before. He's got a ton of background in Hoppington history and interest. And I didn't mean to steal your thunder, James, but no, give us a quick rundown, a thumbnail the, sketch for those watching said at home. thunder before. I mean, a uh, volunteer at Hopkinton Historical among the board of members. Uh, and I've gotten involved with Mike Rowan with the Historic Commission. Mm -hmm. So I've been attending meetings without any position, so I have an understanding of what's going on. And I'm also researching Hopkinton and the surrounding area for the earlier inhabitants and their ancestral grounds. So I find a lot of ceremonial sites in the Hopkinton area. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay, sounds good. It's nice we've got these people this, that are coming up through the ranks in this opportunity. So, so if, if there's no, nobody else, I'll make a motion that uh, we appoint um, Mr. Haskins to an associate member position expiring 63020. Seconded. Okay, it has been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed, that is unanimous, and thank you for thank you. sticking with us, Jim, and coming back. Congratulations. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Now, a little bit behind schedule, but um, at 7 o'clock, now at 7.15, we have the honor of hearing a presentation from the Foundation for Metro West. The Executive Director, Judy Salerno, and Jay Kim, Chief Operating Officer of the Foundation for Metro West, will give a brief presentation on the works of the Foundation for Metro West, which connects philanthropic opportunity with demonstrated need. The Foundation is working with the Hopkinton Country Club Charitable Foundation, as well as the Hopkinton Center for the Arts, on a Youth in Philanthropy program. So welcome, Judy, and uh, also welcome um, Okay. Mr. Kim, <laughs> tell us a little about the foundation. I know. Great. Well, thank you very much for um, allowing us to have a little bit of your time um, this evening. Um, we represent the Foundation for Metro West, which, as you point out, we are a charitable organization. We're based in South Natick, but our mission is actually to provide philanthropic support for a 33 community area, including Hopkinton. And we wanted to just talk a little bit about some of the work we've been doing in the region and specifically in Hopkinton because um, in addition to being a community foundation, one of the things we do is to actually provide a number of different um, services and programs um, to support communities in a, a pretty wide range of ways through, the, through our charter as a community foundation. Um, so the foundation was founded in 1995 by a group of local citizens who felt that the philanthropic needs of this region were not being met by larger charitable organizations in either the city of Boston or Worcester and that there really needed to be an effort to build a source of philanthropy for this region. Um, what we do is we are continuing to build our sources of philanthropy and an endowment and programs um, to uh, promote local philanthropy in the region, to encourage people to think about their philanthropic uh, commitment to this region. We connect um, local donors with needs that exist in the region, and we do a tremendous amount of work helping all of the nonprofits that serve the region um, increase the impact of their work through educational programming. Um, we are a staff of 11. And we are governed by a uh, board of trustees, a volunteer board of trustees of 17 local business and community leaders um, who help us build the resources and build the capacity of the organization. Um, I would just point out one of our staff members is a Hopkinton resident, and as well as one of our trustees. As well as one of our trustees, yep. Um, and to, just to give you a sense of the scope of the work that we're doing regionally, um, in 2017, we invested nearly $2 million in the Metro West region. 
Um, uh, 1.5 million of that was through uh, grant making programs. Um, the remainder of it was through educational programs focused on youth and on nonprofit uh, capacity building. The, as the uh, foundation manages uh, charitable assets of just over $23 million. And um, since our inception, ha we have invested over $15 million in the Metro West region. Um, we manage our um, charitable assets to uh, sustain um, uh, long-term growth and uh, stability in, in um, ensuring that the, the uh, principle of the fund is uh, here forever. Um, so we expect to be here forever and the work that we're doing in the community is work to build this resource not just for what we can do in the community today but that we we want to ensure that this region has a community foundation that has the capacity to um, address issues that are going to arise that none of us actually can foresee and so we are a permanent source of philanthropy for the region um, the way we do it, and, and it's a little technical, but, but we do it through a number of different funds. Right now, we manage 130 different funds. Um, some of those are donor advised funds where we're working with individuals and families. We work with businesses, helping them in their charitable giving through business advised funds. We manage nonprofit agency funds. Um, where nonprofits who have accumulated some capacity to establish a fund to help them in their own sustainability. Um, we have giving area funds that are focused on the foundation's primary charitable giving areas, which are uh, family support, which is all, sort of a broad human services category, um, the environment, which is focused primarily on water quality and um, protection of and advocacy for um, protecting our watersheds and, and um, advocating for um, the quality of water in our area. Um, arts and culture. And um, we have actually in the last uh, several years pulled out our, our hunger relief program, which I'll tell you a little bit more about, and youth. And we have a big focus on working with youth in the region. Um, we also do scholarship funds. We have a number of we have quite a few scholarship funds that are focused um, on local area high school students in a number of our communities. We'd love to see, you know, how we might help uh, folks in in Hopkinton with some of our scholarship fund work and town funds. We actually recognizing not everyone identifies with the Metro West region for the last eight years. We've actually been building funds specific specifically for individual communities. We've built town funds um, and built town boards to manage funds in the towns of Wellesley, Lexington, um, Southboro, and we're in the process of building them in Sherburne and Medfield right now. Um, so those are some of the ways that we um, manage the resources that we use for our grant making programs. In terms of initiatives, we do a regional grant program, which all nonprofits in the Hopkinton area are eligible to um, come to us for support. We um, run over 16 youth and philanthropy programs in the region, which I'll tell you a little bit more about. And our nonprofit educational programs through our Center for Philanthropy Education. There's um, just about every single week um, and over the course of the year over 50 uh, free workshops that we offer to both um, staff and leadership um, and volunteers of the nonprofits that are serving this community and as I just mentioned, our town fund initiatives. Um, our regional grant program, um, I also mentioned that you know, it's focused on these five um, categories, family support, arts and culture, the environment, youth development, and hunger relief. Um, and we, we distributed over one and a half million dollars last year in those um, five critical areas. Um, in terms of our Hopkinton grant making history, since our inception, um, we provided over 40 grants to organizations in the Hopkinton area, um, in, and that totals over $235,000, almost $236,000 that we've invested in the Hopkinton community. A sample of the nonprofits that we've supported have included the Center for the Arts, the Liznow Center, the Symphony Orchestras here, and Project Just Because as part of our hunger relief program. 
Um, I mentioned our hunger relief program. In 2009, we launched a program to provide this support. We've taken a regional approach to this problem. Um, this is a problem that's not going to be solved in individual communities. It's really a very, very much a regional pro problem, and that one, it's one of the great. It's a problem that exists across all 33 of our communities. And the way we address it is by supporting over 50 different um, food and uh, community suppers and. Um, agricultural programs in the areas to try to address the problem regionally. There's not one large food bank or one large food security organization to support, so we do the work to identify where the need is greatest and allocate our resources both for food support as well as capital needs of those organizations. Um, our Center for Philanthropy Education, as I mentioned, um, we do leadership development and workshops to help these organizations um, build their capacity. As you see, as you try to fill out your organizations with skilled and, and, and uh, um, enthusiastic volunteers, it's challenging to find people willing to step up and do that service, and often they don't have the skills and knowledge and training to serve. On, on a nonprofit board. So we take a lot of the responsibility in the community for trying to prepare people for service on boards in community organizations. And all of our services are free of charge. We I want think to make that's sure important. that it's affordable to every, for all of our nonprofits. Um, our Youth and Philanthropy program was launched in 1997, recognizing that this is an area that's really a very family oriented. Um, area, the trustees thought it was important to start trying to engage young people for lives of service both in our communities, which of course being in New England, we are all volunteer led um, communities and organizations. So we think that there's a really important role in preparing young people for lives of service like yourselves are great examples of folks who really have embraced the idea that you have a responsibility. So the Youth and Philanthropy Program is really designed to you know, plant those seeds and, and give those lessons very early on. Um, it is the largest and longest running program of its kind in the country. Um, we've had over 1,500 young people who have participated in the program, and um, almost 100% of them have continued to be involved philanthropically in their lives. We track them. We know that they're doing work on campuses, in their communities, wherever they have settled and lived. But the idea of engaging young people very early on to teach them about the needs of their community, how they can become involved, and how they ultimately can long-term support their communities. Um, so this year, we'll run um, 16 of these programs throughout the Metro West region, including one here in Hopkinton, which is always a program where we have twice as many kids who want to participate as we have spots for them to participate. So we've been running it since 2016. We've really been um, really overwhelmed by the, the positive response that we have from this community, and we think it says a lot about the culture that's already been created here, and we're happy to continue to play a role in fostering that among young people here in Hopkinton. Um, and um, yes, in a short time, we've had almost 80 kids who have participated in the program. They've distributed um, over $30,000 back into the community. And um, two of your alumni, or the alumni from Hopkinton, have been very active participants in our work at the foundation in both, um, one was honored as our 2017 Young Philanthropist of the Year Award, where he was um, acknowledged at a, a, a very large corporate event um, uh, uh, last year in the fall, and it was really, his name was Ben Chere, really terrific kid. And um, they've also continued to participate in helping us as instructors, assistants, and so on. So that's in a nutshell what we do, who we are. I'm happy to answer any questions you have, but I, 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 I think the message we really want you to take away is that we're a resource. We're a resource for the town, and we're a resource for organizations, individuals, and businesses in the town, and that we hope you'll remember us and think of us when you have a need or an opportunity that um, a philanthropic resource that has a tremendous amount of flexibility in how we approach um, our work can help you. Judith, I'm going to, if you'll forbear yeah. me, uh, interrupt you for just a minute sure. because we have a scheduled public hearing at 7.30, which I, you know, don't go away. I don't want to shortchange you and I don't want to shortchange the board's opportunity to ask you a couple questions. Um, I do need to open the 
public hearing, and then we will ask sure. that be paused so we can just come back to you for a sure. couple uh, of Chair, I'll questions. make a motion to um, open the public hearing for the uh, grant of location for the Haven Road Chestnut Street Street for the Verizon New England Never Source. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor of opening the public hearing, please say aye. 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 Okay, and now do we need a motion to pause it? Mr. Come on, do I need to ask the applicant to be willing to wait a few moments or? Okay, to whoever, the folks who are here for the public hearing, um, if you would be so kind, we would like to just conclude with the presentation from the Foundation for Metro West and we will pick up the public hearing in just a minute. Okay, so questions. I, I will say, I will jump in first and say, last year I did not know anything about this foundation at all. And then we had the wonderful honor, as you mentioned, of one of our very own, Hopkinson's Bench Ray, who received the Youth and Philanthropy Award. I believe we honored him here at our meeting. And I know I and maybe Mr. Catino attended the event. It was such an example of the kind of confidence and presence um, that is developed in these young people to see him stand up in front of a room of, oh, probably easily 500 people and address them. Um, and it was just a, it's just a wonderful organization. I think probably enough people don't know about it. I didn't know anything about it. Um, I would, I'll let the board ask other questions, but I would love for the people watching at home to for you to just give a little bit more on explanation of how your youth and philanthropy program works because we've had great participation in Hopkinton and the fact that these young people actually have a chunk of money that they are allowed to give out using these principles of philanthropy that have been taught. So you know, it's, it's not like monopoly money. This is real money, and they actually, they actually make these grants. So if you folks would permit for a minute, I'd just like Judy to sure, just explain that a little that. more for people. Um, I think there's a couple of important things. I mean, our role with this program is really about preparing young people for lives of leadership and service. I mean, that's really at the heart of what we do. As I mentioned, this is New England. Our communities are only as good as the people who are willing to serve them, and we think it's important to start very young in doing that and preparing them. It is a semester-long program. It's a voluntary program. It is free, and we look for high school students who are interested in participating in the 16 programs, one being here. And during that 17-week program, we teach young people about the needs of their community, how nonprofit organizations work, um, they actually, we receive grant applications from local youth serving organizations that the students are taught how to review um, grant applications, um, how to evaluate a nonprofit financial 990 statement. They then are um, given the opportunity to uh, um, think about where, if they were to have some financial resources, where they might, might want to invest them. And they decide which organizations they want to learn more about, and they go on site visits. So through that process, we take them to local organizations where they ask really tough questions of the leadership of those organizations. They then have to come back to their group and come to consensus on how they would um, allocate charitable funds. The foundation, um, and here in Hopkinton, we partner with the Hopkinton um, Country Club Charitable Foundation. We partner with them to provide $9,000 of grant making funds. The students are asked to raise $1,000 to contribute to the grant making. And then typically they make two grants of $5,000 each to local youth organizations. They then have to present those decisions to a room like this full of um, adults who ask them very difficult questions on how they came to their decision. And then after that's all completed, there's a celebratory event where they present their checks to the nonprofit agencies and receive a graduation certificate. And many of them continue on to either serve local nonprofits, um, work uh, 
as, as volunteers in nonprofits or work um, with us on our program in future years. You know, the other um, young woman that I would tell you about is a young woman um, from Hopkinton who was so taken with the organization that they supported called Hope and Comfort, which provides um, health and beauty products to local um, food pantries and so on, that she runs some sort of Etsy business and for every bag that she makes and sells on Etsy, she donates um, $10 of her proceeds to that. And I saw her at an event where she gave them a check for $250. So um, it's not an insignificant thing, and that's the impact that this program has on kids with what we introduce them to. I would just so. add that there's a lot of leadership development that, that goes you know, along with this program, that what we call 21st century skills, learning about collaboration, learning about consensus building, public speaking, obviously Ben Charest standing Absolutely. in front of that yeah. group. Yeah. So those are the types of, of, of things that we focus on as well as, as it relates to this program. What a wonderful real life hands-on experience. You give them this um, $10,000 and they take it very seriously. It's, a, it's not a, a thing that's you know faint of heart for adults to give young people that kind of money, but sure money. they are really, really good stewards of it. Absolutely. Board members, other comments, questions? Mr. Herr. So my son went through the youth and philanthropy process uh, here in town, I think two years ago. And uh, what, what struck me is when they went out and did their site visits and they came back, they had multiple places they went and they had to make decisions about where they should donate their funds, the funds they raised along with the grant money. And it was a hard decision for them. And it was a hard decision for them because I think he and others saw a lot of need in the community that he didn't know, they didn't know existed before. So it really opened their eyes to, while we live in a nice community, that there are still struggles in any community. And uh, I think that was very, uh, very helpful for him as he was maturing as a person. So I think that's uh, a really, well yeah, I think it's a really important point. I think so many of us identify as Bostonians and we get all of our media messages and our sports teams are from Boston. But, you know, this is Hopkinton, this is Metro West, and there are philanthropic needs in this area. And our work is really to just raise the visibility that we hope that people develop their own personal charitable giving strategies by looking at their neighborhood, their town, their region um, as part of it. And doing it with young people is how a part of what, what we yeah, do. Yeah, he really enjoyed it and he learned a lot. Second point I would make, or just maybe a question for the, my colleagues and for the town manager and perhaps some others that I think are in the audience in the back there. We have the Hopkinton Education Foundation, HEF, and we have the 26.2 Foundation uh, that supports a lot of different things that goes on in town. But I think they're kind of steered towards specific you know, approaches or, or opportunities in the community. I don't know if we have a more broad uh, scale foundation, like you mentioned several towns there, several towns that we are very similar to in, in population and, okay. and economics and so forth. I'm wondering if that's something we should maybe be trying to look at and partner with these folks to develop over time. Just can't decide it tonight, but something that I think to throw out there. Food for thought. Yeah. Well, my Thank favorite you. thing about it is that, that the training that's going on, and, and as Mr. Hurst said, for his uh, son's eyes to be open to, th there are needs in this town, and and and, and in Metro West. Yeah. People people may believe that um, that everybody's doing just fine, but um, there are real needs, and those real needs have to be met, and to train the next generation, uh, not just to give, but to give responsibly and to uh, ask the right questions and to make sure that the um, money's being used effectively. Because there's, there, you know, there, are, there are a lot of uh, organizations that waste a lot of money in, in, the, um, in the running of the organization and not much of it gets to the people that need it. And so I, I just, it, the first thing I knew about it was the Youth and Philanthropy from, from a few years ago when I was on the board. And then uh, I went to the event um, last year and, and realized, wow, and then, and then even now with this presentation, even more in depth of, of, of just the, uh, the breadth of the, uh, of the Metro West organization. But thank you very much for, for your um, talk today. So I actually had no idea that you existed. And um, <laughs> you know, I sure don't feel bad. They're <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> right there. <laughs> I'm so happy that you're here. Because you know, as a parent, um, you know, I look at my, my kids and they're focused on their own little world, and you know I'm tr constantly trying to get them to open their eyes and uh, and pay attention to what's going on in the world. And it seems like you guys have 
kind of grabbed that and, and, and made our kids kind of open their eyes and see what else is out there. And I think that's, that's huge. Cause any, from my perspective, anything that is gonna enhance our children's experience um, and give them leadership skills and allow them to you know, see the world in a different, a different viewpoint, uh, that's invaluable. Um, especially with the, with the competition that I see coming from <laughs> overseas, from worldwide, from even from within. Uh, anything that's going to help our kids broaden their horizons, I think, is magnificent. So I just want to say thank you for everything you're doing. And um, I think my son and I are going to have a conversation about <laughs> that. <laughs> so I was uh, made aware of how you guys worked last year when the kids from the uh, school came in and talked about it, and I was bowled over, absolutely bowled over by uh, how in-depth they were, how... Uh, involved they were, how passionate they were. When you think back, I think back to when I was a kid growing up, uh, you know, my goal was to work my paper route, get enough money to buy a wrestling magazine, and practice my wrestling moves with my neighbors. Uh, these guys are out trying to make, turn 10,000 bucks into a million bucks and, and, and to give it away. It's, it's, a, it's a great uh, concept. And I know that our schools teach the kids, you know, uh, the schools have come a very long way from when we were kids where you know my kids come home and they're talking about helping out here and my daughter uh, volunteers down at just because and uh, does you know, lemonade stands when something happens and they want to send the money in there so the whole concept is kind of ingrained in the kids um, when they're young and then to have a program like this available you know, when they get to, to be uh, aged up to, to utilize it is something that I'm certainly, like uh, Mr. Nasrula said, certainly something that I would uh, love to have my kids get involved in. So thank you for taking the time and coming Great. and make the presentation tonight. Thank you. We really appreciate you coming and speaking to us, and I hope that all the people watching at home have learned something. And, uh, you know, we'll, I guess you're over-enrolled with Hopkinton kids, <laughs> but that, that's a good thing. They can thing go to other we're... places, too. We have some programs that are regional programs, and so we have kids that from Hopkinton that actually participate in programs in the Natick and Sudbury and around the region. So we're happy to have as many as you want to send our way. They're great kids. And thank you all very much for your time tonight. We know you have a busy agenda, a lot to deal with. So we really appreciate it. Thank well, we much. are really grateful. Thank grateful you. for all that you do. Thank and you. thank you thank for you coming. So well, if we can now return to our public hearing, um, we, we have one between. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We also have a presentation by the 26.2 Foundation. So if, again, our friends from Eversource and Verizon will forbear, we would like to hear from Mr. Kilduff. Um, Tim, come on up. We apologize. We are way, way off schedule tonight. No need to apologize. It's the way it goes sometimes. <laughs> Of course. Ooh, fancy. Ooh. Used up some color ink. Good evening, Good evening young man. How are you this evening? <laughs> we yeah, are, are fine, you? Mr. Kilduff. What have you got for us? Good news, I hope. There is good news. Um, before I begin, you know, you, you did me a favor a couple weeks ago, Claire, when you said, uh, when you asked me a question about the the board of directors of the 26.2 Foundation. So I think some of this gets uh, narrowly focused, but um, I, wanna, I, I wanted to introduce you to three of the directors of the foundation, Joe Baldiga, uh, Mike Lawrence, you know, and Bruce McDonald, all residents of Hopkinton. Welcome. They're part of about an eight person uh, board. Great, well thank you for coming, Claire, gentlemen. How does this get on? Uh... Huh? I'm sorry? I have no idea. I'm not going to touch it, though. Let, I'll <laughs> let you do it. Part of the, uh, while we're, uh, we're, we're playing with that. Here we go. Uh, I wanted to, I was uh, this week in Washington, D.C. Uh, at the Marine Corps Marathon, and I think there are two examples that I wanted to share with you to put uh, our marathon footprint in, in uh, perspective. 
Uh, the one is, uh, Catherine Switzer was there, and she um, made it very clear that she wanted to be remembered to you for the gift that you gave her on the 50th anniversary of her race, and, and John, for the work you did running around making sure that her 100 runners had water. Uh, the other was, I had the opportunity to spend a few minutes with uh, General Dunford, who happens to be the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, at the moment, and I think doing a spectacular job, by the way. But it was very interesting because uh, that he pulled me aside and, and asked about Bob LaVoy. Uh, was that we before had a, he passed? Pardon? Had he passed at that yes, point? Yes, he oh. had. But uh, he, we had a quiet conversation uh, they did, Bob Lavoy and three other Marines uh, a few years ago. But it was, it was it, it, I always get touched by this because here's this guy that's worrying about Afghanistan and the rest of the world, and he wanted to make sure that Bob's family had gotten his message, um, which is, is part of this mystique about, uh, about Hopkins' connection to the, to the marathon. And I just wanted to take a couple of minutes, and I, I gave you a hard copy because we don't have time to go through all of this. We could spend uh, a, a considerable amount of time. But this is the, the, the mission of the foundation, which really, uh, really focuses on using the marathon as a platform. Um, but uh, just a brief history. Uh, we started uh, the Hopkins Athletic Association back in 1996 with the support of the Board of Selectmen and the, and the uh, Boston Athletic Association. Um, we began uh, very humble beginnings, but as, uh, as we began to realize that a 501c3 IRS status was, uh, was approved at that point. As we got more and more involved, we began to realize that our reach uh, goes beyond our borders, uh, and we started to take on a more global uh, view of, of, uh, of marathoning and our involvement in the world, the community's involvement in the world and how we reach out. So we changed it to the 26.2 Foundation. And by the way, I want to point out that I got so nervous. There's so much news, uh, topics in the, the, the borders are being discussed. I misspelled borders on this, on this, uh, uh, on this. I don't know why I, whether I was nervous or I'm too absorbed with the news, but uh, I wanted to make sure you, I pointed it out. Uh, and everything we do supports and enriches, enriches Hopkins' brand. You're gonna be dealing with uh, an issue later of uh, trails, for example, uh, and that's an, this is another example where you've got a community with several different groups that have been able to now, they're pretty close to creating a network through the whole community. It's pretty phenomenal what we're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can't take all the credit for that, but we do, we do push it. Uh, this is a list of some of our partners that we're dealing with. That list is getting bigger and bigger. Uh, again, you can, you can look at that in terms of your, uh, uh, your hard copies. Uh, but I put the Board of Select and the Hopkins Athletic Association at the top because you are allies. Uh, this, while we are a private 501c3 organization, everything we've done from the day we started has been in collaboration with the town. Uh, and that's really important to us. And there are other organizations like the Marine Corps Marathon. GRL Architects uh, has provided a tremendous amount of, uh, of uh, support and in-kind services for us. Uh, the Athens Marathon Corporate Communications is, is another one. Um, you all know Bob Dubinsky, he serves on Parks and Rec. Uh, if we have an issue in terms of, of, of really <coughs> presenting or positioning, uh, we, we go to him and he gives us a lot of valuable advice. So our marathon footprint, those are just two examples, three examples. Those sculptures, particularly the Kerry Keaty sculpture, now is, uh, has worldwide recognition. When we bring the wreaths, uh, to the Marine Corps Marathon for Marathon Greece. They're presented in, in, in the name of Hopkinton and also Stellianos Karakides. Uh, the Browns, we don't have to talk about that. We know how powerful that is. And the start of this, uh, of this Boston Marathon provides a great platform. We, we, we named the, the, the town named the, uh, the, 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 the new elementary school marathon. I, I just want to reinforce the fact that that is a significant story globally. When we pushed that out to the marathon world, they were, oh, everybody got excited. These are people that run international organizations. 
that can't believe uh, that this community did that. So it's a pro powerful tool for us. Uh, you know about the Elmwood, and we can spend a, we can again spend 40 minutes on that. But that Hancock Elmwood program is the only program of its type in the world. Uh, it's been going on for tw over 20 years. Uh, it's a phenomenal program, uh, and will continue. They're still committed to that. This middle school, uh, is, uh, just want to touch on that briefly. The teachers in the middle school have created something called Desire to Inspire. And they, again, they use the marathon as a platform, but they use it to inspire kids across the board, not just in terms of running. In fact, most of the stuff they do is, is, uh, is beyond the, the world of running. Joe Kennedy was a speaker, and there have been others, uh, and they'll continue to, that program is now, has now uh, been strengthened. You okay? <laughs> the other thing that uh, we have all been involved with over the years is, is expanding this footprint, but now there are other entities in town that are picking up on this. There are, there, there are, there are two examples there. One is the banner program that the Chamber of Commerce initiated, which was, I think, spectacular. So there were banners paid for by businesses in town that went from a uh, little, little further than the starting line almost to the, and this year they'll reach the town line, they'll reach the Ashland line. I don't want to pick on our neighbors, but I saw the program that they did and this was significantly better. <coughs> and the other is the, the, the Marathon Spectacular that Western Nurseries did last spring with, uh, uh, with Start Line Brewing. Tough year to do this kind of program, but they've committed to do it again. Uh, weather dependent and it's gonna be terrific. So moving forward. Uh, we want to spend our time continuing to develop and implement programs that expand Hopkinton's footprint. That's the number one objective. And it allows us, again, to communicate globally. Uh, the other is to expand our global reach. Uh, I gave you two examples at the Marine Corps Marathon, uh, and there are others, uh, both in, uh, in, in Greece and in China now. Uh, the Greek-American community has realized the kind of uh, influence that we have in this in this sphere, uh, so our reach is going to now begin to spread, uh, and we're we've just uh, we're ready to launch uh, an advisory committee on the International Marathon Center. We could spend an hour in the Marathon Center. We won't do that, but we're moving in this area. Uh, the kind of people uh, that'll be serve on that advisory committee are Dick and Rick Hoyt, Catherine Switzer, the bureau chief of Bloomberg News in Boston. Uh, Amby Burfoot, who's a marathon uh, champion. Richard Johnson, who's the curator of the, muse uh, the New England Sports Museum, and Governor Dukakis. Uh, and there's, a, uh, there's another individual who's run at least 25 marathons uh, uh, who we've asked to join, and that's uh, Brian Herr, because of his marathon, exp marathon ex ex uh, experience. Um, opportunities, again, very quickly. I have the, on the top the blue line. Uh, what we've been able to do in large part because of the work that, that John Cotino has done in, in terms of meeting with the BAA, uh, they want to they enhance the start of the marathon. There's a blue line, as you know, uh, at the end of the race. It's the last mile, I think it is. Uh, we're, we're gonna, we'd like this community to work with them to create a, from the starting line, to the, to the to hopefully the, the <clears throat> town line in Hopkinton, which will again mirror what's happening in Boston. It's gonna bring the, the image of what we're doing up substantially. Um, the Bobby Gibbs sculpture, we now have uh, a contract with her. She's created a, uh, a clay model. Uh, it's a self-portrait, if you will. She's a very good sculptor. Uh, so that's in the works now. We're in the process of raising the funds necessary to do that. You have the board uh, a year ago uh, communicated with her, hoping, uh, communicating with her, hoping that this sculpture would be uh, placed somewhere in Hopkinton and we'll start that, that process um, before the year's out. Uh, Hopkinton Library and the Ashland Libraries, uh, we have uh, decided that we want to create uh, marathon sections in both of those libraries. There's some books. Um, in, in Hopkinton, not very many, uh, but we're excited about this. So people like Catherine and others will donate their books to Hopkinton. 
We've already, uh, we've already started uh, the organizational structure in Hopkinton. We'll have some volunteers working with the staff here. The staff has been very helpful uh, and very excited about the possibilities. I think w we try not to scare them because there are, there are more than 100 books. There are lots of marathon-related books. Uh, and we think we can be selective uh, and, develop, uh, and develop a pretty good, uh, pretty good set of books here. Uh, we want to be much, much more aggressive in sharing our, um, our examples and the kind of the successful programs that we have. We want to share those with other communities. And I want to touch very quickly on the state curriculum. Every, right now, every sixth grader studies ancient Greece. Um, the state has decided they're going to shift the curriculum around uh, so that they can do more work in the area of heaven, thank heavens, civics. Um, and so they're moving that the, the, the Greek curriculum to the seventh grade. Uh, our teachers are going to be in, the, in, the, in, a, in a really key position. We're collecting the materials that they use. Uh, we're going to share them with the state. And we think we're going to have an influence on, the, on that particular curric uh, curriculum statewide. We're really excited about that. We're going to launch the second phase of the cross-country co course, you recall. Uh, we worked with the school department and created a, uh, a, a short course that the middle school has been using. Uh, we want to expand that so ultimately the high school kids will be able to run a cross-country competition behind the high school. If you haven't seen, uh, the middle, uh, Brian's been there and he's seen the middle school, to get the, the, the cross-country kids who don't get much notoriety to be able to run by the rest of the teams and have those teams stop and cheer them on is, is really quite heartwarming. So we're excited about that. It's really a thrill. And then finally, uh, in, in this particular area, these opportunities, uh, we're gonna launch a, a program. Uh, it'll be, it'll be uh, taped uh, and in conjunction with, with HCAM, uh, and it will focus solely on marathon-related subjects, again, based in Hopkinton. Uh, we're going to work with them to put that on YouTube, and it's going to expand our reach immensely. We believe there's an audience globally for the kind of product that we can, produ uh, we can produce. And then finally, um, our request is pretty simple. Um, and you have been kind and supportive uh, the last few years to give, uh, give us some time to give you a quick update. Uh, but it's important that uh, we seek your endorsement uh, of the admission of the 26.2 Foundation, which you have continued to support of the creation of the International Marathon Center. And we owe you a major update on that one. Uh, encourage the 26.2 Foundation's involvement and expansion in non-logistic aspects of the race. We have a marathon committee that deals with the logistics aspects that does a terrific job. That's not what we're looking at. We're looking at the kind of stuff we, we've been talking about the last few minutes. And then finally, the continued support. Uh, we've been getting uh, charity numbers since 1996, uh, and we hope to continue that. It's a great source of funding for us, obviously. So collapsed. Uh, it is, in fact, a, a for, particularly for me and the directors of the foundation, it is a personal privilege to be able to blend the, 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 the fact that the Boston Marathon starts here with the activities in the community with this potential for a global reach and ultimately the development of International Marathon Center in Hopkinton. Uh, and we appreciate the opportunity to come in periodically and give you an update. Uh, and as always, we're more than happy to drill down either now or in the future with either of you, uh, either as a group or individually on any questions or issues that you may have. Well, thank you for the update, Tim. Um, I think you know that the town has supported you in your endeavor. The 26.2 Foundation and the town of Hopkinton um, share mutual goals and uh, mutually benefit one another as well. And um, I can't speak for the entire board of the entire town, but I would certainly expect that uh, that commitment and that partnership uh, will continue into the future. Um, you've already done great things and uh, there's greater things on the horizon, so we're, we're delighted to have that partnership. Well, if, if I may, can I, can I make a motion Please. to support them? 
I'd like to make a motion to endorse the mission of the 26.2 Foundation, continue to support the creation of an international marathon center, encourage the 26.2 Foundation's involvement and expansion to non-logistic aspects of Hopkinton's marathon footprint, and finally support the Foundation's receipt of the uh, Boston Marathon charity entries. Second. Excellent. Are there questions or comments from board members? I think they do a great job, and uh, I like the idea of continuing to further expand uh, the brand and uh, the awareness of what happens here in town, but also how that can go uh, elsewhere around the globe. And I'm 110% uh, behind everything they do. So for me, I've said it before and I'll say it again, uh, Mr. Kilduff is like the Energizer Bunny when it comes to this stuff. He's been <laughs> on point, he's been motivated, dedicated. Uh, we're fortunate to have someone like this that's in our corner, not just putting together this 26.2 foundation, but someone who's so passionate about the town of Hopkinton. He's been a resident of Hopkinton forever. Um, you know, it, it's just, it's a win-win. And uh, anytime I see Mr. Kilduff on the agenda to come in and, and make a presentation or to discuss, uh, discuss things with us, I know that it's gonna be condensed, succinct, and to the point. There's no fluff. And uh, I certainly appreciate uh, his update and your hard work is not lost on this board. Thank you. Thank you. Night with Kilduff is always a good night. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed. That is unanimous. Did I shortchange you, Mr. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, you did. Quick here. <laughs> Real quick, though. You know, um, in our tiny little town, to have this international event come every year, uh, you know, we come to take it. I've come to, you know, just expect it and take advantage of it. Not, not even really understanding like uh, how much work really goes on behind the scenes. So I just want to say thank you for for everything you're doing. Uh, we sponsored a runner from Greece uh, about five oh, wow. years ago, yeah. and and we got a chance to hang out with him and all of the. There was a whole Greek dele delegation that came over, and uh, it just. Yeah, it's hard to put my finger on it to say what I'm trying to say, but just the international reach that we have here in Hopkinton is incredible. Um, these, these, these guys from Greece, they could not wait to come here and just run around. That was fabulous, so thank you. Well, to your time, I'm with them. Blair, um, if I may, uh, I, I really want the, the, all of you up here to, un, I guess, understand and, and um, accept the fact that I consider this a personal privilege. I really do. To be, to, to be able to go to some place like Washington and have the kind of conversations that I've had based on our connection and in, 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 in what we do here in Hopkinton is, a, is an absolute thrill for me. Uh, and I understand taking time out of your schedule is important and it's, it's extremely significant and I, uh, I don't underestimate um, the value and the power that comes from the collaboration between the 26.2 Foundation and this board. Uh, it's a, it's a it's extremely important to me, and I appreciate it. So thank you. The admiration and the appreciation is mutual. So thank, thank you. you so much thank for you. coming, Tim. Uh, we're really glad to hear thank, the update. Thank you for the time. Tim, just a quick side note: the uh, Elmwood thing that I've gone to for years and years. It got quiet there for a couple of years for whatever reason. I think they're just toning it all down. But in the last two or three years, I hear the volume coming right back up. So it's gotten quite ruckus again. Uh, I think it's great. I love it. It did get quiet for a while. Yeah, sure. it's really, it's been great. I Lord, love thank it. you for your time. Thank you so much. And to our friends now uh, who have been very patient <coughs> from um, Verizon New England and Eversource. The Board of Selectmen will consider acting on two petitions submitted by Verizon and Eversource to relocate one pole on Chestnut Street and four poles on Hayden Row in order to accommodate design changes to the Hayden Row Chestnut Street intersection, a town project. The utility poles will be relocated within the road right of way. 
Welcome. Good evening. And you are? My name is Ross Billadu. I'm representing Verizon New England this, this evening. Okay, Eversource, yes, no, no. Okay, Ross, thank you for coming. Uh, I know we've all had a chance, I think, to look at your diagram and got a bit of a sense of what's going on. Mr. Westerling is here too, but do you want to just give us a quick rundown and uh, be open to board questions? Sure. As you stated, a uh, handful of pole relocations uh, going on in the vicinity of Hayden Row and Chestnut Street intersection. Um, these pole relocations are needed to support a road widening and safety improvements project that's going on in that area. Um, there are no new poles being added. We're just jostling around a uh, couple of the existing poles, five of them in fact, four of them on Hayden Row and one of them on Chestnut Street in order to support that project. Well, it certainly makes sense. I've looked at where the old poles are and where the new poles are going is, is you know, a very logical um, move that's going to improve the whole area. Any sense of when the moving would actually happen? I'm not sure of any timeline uh, at this point, but I know that they are working out there. I went out and reviewed the site before I come to the meeting, and um, I, I'm assuming something will be happening pretty soon. So. Mr. Kamalo, do you have some information on that? way back in, in March, and I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed that we're just getting to this hearing now. Um, this, in fact, is putting the project in jeopardy. Our goal was to finish this project uh, before um, the commencement of the winter season this year, and based on where we are, I don't see this work being done until next spring, and this is very frustrating. Well, I believe our work here is done. <laughs> I, mean, I know that that intersection has been torn up for a while with our own project and created its own share of traffic snarls, so it would be nice if we could get this done and complete and not, not keep it going. Um, sure, I wasn't privy to any of the, you know, backstory to any of the project prior to meeting, but I will uh, ask my colleagues to expedite the project uh, to try and ease your guys' concerns. I mean, I was glad when I saw this on the agenda that they actually are planning on moving the poles because this has been an ongoing sore spot throughout the town. Um, clearly this is part of our own project we want done, but I know as you probably are aware we've had a bit of a history in recent years of this board um, refusing requests from the utility companies until they got some of this work done, which as Mr. Kamalo says, has been like pulling teeth on absolutely everything. Um, so, you know, we want this done for our project, but, um, you know, it, it just seems to be that every single time it, it, it takes an inordinate amount of time and it's a tremendous inconvenience for the town and um, doesn't do good for building relationships, let's put it that way. Mr. Herr? So I, you, you've just got the sign to come out tonight and represent us and represent the firm and here we are, but this exact conversation we've had for the last five years. Yep. And so this is not a reflection on you as an individual. No, no. But it's just on lucky, the lucky your guy that company, got the we all work tonight. for companies, so we all get it, yeah. has just annoyed us to no end every time they walk in the building. And nothing to, I mean, I've never seen this man get frustrated before. <laughs> Uh, I like it though. Yeah, that was pretty cool, huh? <laughs> yeah, Fresh yes. like, I don't get on Fresh the wrong meat. side of him all of a sudden. Fresh meat. Um, I just, you know, this is just a broken record for me sitting here for 10 years and it, whatever. Just, we got to fix it. Okay. Just echoing what Brian said, I've never seen Mr. Kamalo get react in such a <laughs> Sorry, sure. Um I understand your position, but uh, if you could please relay the the concerns of the town, um, you know, we're supposed to be working together here. So. Absolutely. So now you know why when they were asking for volunteers to come out tonight, everybody else stepped back. <laughs> hey, that yeah. might be the case. Well, with that, uh, uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to uh, 
um, make a motion that we approve the two petitions uh, submitted by Verizon never supposed to relocate one pole on Chestnut Street and four poles on Hayden Row in order to accommodate design changes to the Hayden Row Chestnut Street intersection, which is a town project. Are there any other comments or questions from the board before we take a vote? Hearing none. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed, it is unanimous. So thank you for coming. Uh, as Mr. Hurst said, it's not about you personally, but um, Understood. You know, <laughs> we'd like to see a little, uh, a little change. Great. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you Thanks for waiting for us, too. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm sorry. Did we vote to close the public hearing? Oh, I'm sorry. I, ooh. Um, no, we did not. So let's think this through. We can Should still we do that now. Just, just close the that, public hearing and the then take the vote again? Yes. Withdraw the motion, withdraw the vote. And yes. Two okay. Yeah, I'll withdraw my motion. So Mr. Cotino has withdrawn his motion. I must first request a motion to close the public hearing. So is there anyone else here that has any comments about these polls? That's true. Okay. Okay, Madam not. Chair, I move that we close the public hearing. Second. All right. All those in favor of closing the public hearing, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, it is unanimous. And now, Mr. Cortino, would you yes. please make the motion again? And I apologize for making the motion no, early. I just I felt badly for, for the guy it. getting beat up by us. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to uh, propose a, a, a motion to approve the petition submitted by Verizon and Eversource to re relocate one pole on Chestnut Street and four poles on Hayden Row in order to accommodate design changes to the Hayden Row Chestnut Street intersection, which is a town project. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed, that is unanimous. Okay. Sorry about that. And now we have, a little bit late, uh, our apologies, a joint meeting with the Permanent Building Committee to discuss Center School. The Board of Selectmen will discuss the future use of Center School with the Permanent Building Committee, PBC, including recommendations of the Center School Reuse Advisory Team, identifying a specific task and its related goals for the PBC, which may include, but are not limited to, conducting a feasibility study, reviewing the future uses of the building, and ways to improve the utilization of space in the building. So, are there room, is there room for everybody? Everybody has a seat. And I know we have some of the members of the Center School Committee are here. I think we can just maybe. I think Mr. Flannery's gonna sit here. Mr. Flannery, come up and we can call on the other members for input as needed. It's the meeting actually is between the selectmen and the, and the PBC. Right. So, Mr. Right. McIntyre saving it's, seats like the old school the bus center. days, huh? It is not with the Center School Reuse Committee, although I think they should be here. So, for you. okay, all right. Well, we are we are here to discuss with the PBC. And, and for the record, we did post a PBC meeting, so the four of us are legal here. Okay, you're legal here. So, gentlemen. Have you had an opportunity to take a look at the work of the Center School Reviews Committee so far? I have. We, we looked at their report and uh, looks like they did a good job of getting public involvement and trying to figure out what to do with that building. And I think they came to the right conclusion that it's a, a good building to save for the town. As you probably understand, their charge was not really to get, you know, deeply into the nitty gritty or the weeds of, of costs or construction or whatever, as much as gauge town concerns, town needs, um, and, and take kind of a, you know, 35,000 foot view of the project. Um, they certainly, you know, have done an extensive amount of work over a year and gotten a lot of input. So um, I think from our last meeting, this board was certainly satisfied that they've done a very good, made a very good effort to take the pulse of the town 
and also that we've um, you know determined there are a lot of town needs within various boards and departments and committees um, that need to be met in one way or another um, and there seemed to be quite a strong town consensus that this is the building that the community would like to see retained for municipal use in, in municipal in the municipal realm um, so our next step is to figure out how we get there and start to look at what's what is is practical and maybe from that get a clearer sense of um, how we should go about this so well I think I think we do have the skill set to take it to that next step mm -hmm. uh, and, and do a more in-depth feasibility study. so I'm sorry Dan can you hang on for one sec because I think I'm a little confused one I support the idea of the community keeping this building just putting that right out there I don't think we've made that decision however I think we made a decision to get the permanent building community involved have them, I don't think the town's made that decision, if you will, uh, and get input from them as to how we would proceed and what we would do, et cetera, et cetera. But the decision to save a, what is it, 40,000 square foot building on behalf of the town, that formal decision has not been made. And I think we gotta be careful with that. Well, if, if I may, I, maybe, maybe I misspoke or you misunderstood. Um, what I was attempting to do was to summarize what came out of the work of the, of the Center School Reuse Committee and the message that had come out of the surveys with the town. They definitely recommended that, I agree. Not and that I'm it's a decision, but this was the overarching message that has come out from their work. And I'm on board with Which that decision, but I'm not sure what the process is for us to decide to keep that building. Which and, is why I think I, we bring them I, in. One of the questions, see, w w I, I, I when you were speaking, I thought that you jumped when you said um, the, asking the Permanent Building Committee how to further utilize it and everything and, and, and put it to practical use. I want my, my first question to ask the Permanent Building P Committee, is it practical? That's my first question. Before we get to see how, how to ch chop it up and everything, is it practical to, uh, um, given, given the, the age of the building and the amount of work that's needed to th that we need municipal uses There's, we have a lot of uses that can, that that uh, need to be taken care of but that's However, the kind of question it, that would be answered I, 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 that's think that's, that, I think that's getting to brian's point right uh, whereas i don't we don't know the answer to that question and that's why that that's why we need to we'll do the feasibility that's, study if that's it comes out we, to be a hundred million dollars to right. do this building nobody wants to spend well, that's why we would turn to them, because that goes beyond the scope of what the, the center school team was able to do. So the next step is to discuss, discuss or investigate, is it practical, and everything that is it practical means. But, but I just want to make sure that we weren't going into, into okay, let's, let's start designing it and see how much it costs. I want to make first to answer, is it even feasible? And then, then get into it. So let's just let's get, let's, let's also we'll take it from thirty thousand feet to ten thousand. So, so okay. here's my sense of what's happening. As a community, we are emotionally tied to this building. I don't think there's any doubt in the community that that's the case. And I'm emotionally tied to that building. And I've been here twenty years, and all my kids went through that building. And I want to see Hopkinton keep that building too. But I don't want to rush the decision or rush, rush the message that we have decided to keep that building. We haven't yet. The, the, the Rick's committee did a great job. The feasibility or whatever, reuse whatever it's called. Advisory. Reuse advisory committee, thank you. Right. Uh, did a great job. And now we need to get into some, a little bit more of the nitty gritty into some numbers and things yeah. like that. And once we figure that out, then I think the community can have some forums and we can start talking about cash and cash flow and a lot of other things that are going to come with this. But I'm just, what I heard was, and I apologize if I misheard it, was the community decided to keep the building and this is what we're going to do. No. And no. we got to be very careful not to message that because I'm going to hear about it on the fields this weekend. No. If that's what the message is. No. Because that's I, not, I said, we're not, we're not, we're not um, fully all bought into this concept. No. no. I, and I apologize if that's what was communicated because what I meant to, in, to say was that the, predominant opinion from the public surveys and the public forums was a community desire to keep this building in the municipal totally realm, agree. which totally is why the next step is now to start to look at 
Is yeah, it feasible? Totally and, and I would add to Mr. Coutinho's mm -hmm. comment about feasibility, I think even feasibility, feasibility depends on what you find when the committee, were they to take this on, starts to look into, you look into what the needs are, you look into what the building has to offer or doesn't have to offer, and that's when you actually look into configurations. You know, feasibility might depend on, do you, we talked about almost like three separate buildings, the 29, the, the 50s, 60s, and the 80, you know, looking at all three buildings is, is a different kind of feasibility than taking out the middle section and just doing the 80s and the other, you know, that's where you would get into, right. you know, feasibility costs depending on how you decide to design it. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to do some programming based on the, the needs that were identified in the, in the reuse committee's report yep. and then work that into a cost estimate so we can see yeah. what, what the talk is going to look like. If I recall correctly, what we, where we left off in one of the discussions we were having was do we engage the services of, of an architect or of any kind of firm where we're going to expend funds mm -hmm. when we have not yet made a decision? And I think that was Brian's big concern is do we spend money in determining what to do with this uh, without going to town meeting? Um, and I think, I mean, I think that that was kind of the, the stumbling block, and I think that's where we left off. But we also said that we would engage our colleagues on the Permanent Building Committee to come, and bear with us, guys. We're going to come back to you here in a minute. We've got to, <laughs> we've got to fix our own mess we, first. Uh, we're, we're also going to go reach out to our colleagues on the PBC and let them help us start to figure out right. what it was all going to look like as we would go into a town meeting. Maybe the thing that we could also add to this process is we could get with Mr. Camalo and Mr. Mieres and outline to all of us and to the public at large what would be the process that we as a community would follow. We have never bought a building like this that's up and historic and got some needs to, for work, et cetera, that I can remember anyway. What would be the process to make all this happen and get that outlined for us too and let's make that a very public document as to how this will all play out. You know what I'm saying? Mr. This has town meeting written all over it, but I don't know exactly how we get to town meeting. Through the chair, in, in terms of outlining a process uh, for answering the questions that are raised by the board, um, taking the unique characteristics of this site and building in, in, into consideration, I think is doable. However, in terms of today's discussion, I think the board needs to clarify what the it remains, it refers to. I keep hearing doing a feasibility study for it, well, but what is the it? What I hear on one hand is that the feasibility study focuses on the recommendations of the center school reuse advisory team. I also hear on the other hand comments suggesting that there's something else that we should be evaluating. Uh, is, is that the case? Or That's is not what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah. So what, what, then, what, what then is the it? What, what the feasibility study is going to be on what? If, in, if from this seat, it's the feasibility study, and I would like the plan Permanent Building Committee to engage in, in understanding and getting preliminary numbers and things without spending money of any consequence. Maybe there's a little $5,000 budget or something for that uh, to get some budget numbers. I get it. Um, uh, but of the feasibility of maintaining and preserving that site and that building on that site uh, for the uses outlined by the reuse committee. That's, that's my view of this situation. Uh, and then once we have that information and we have the process that we would follow for doing some work that they may suggest, you know, then what's the process to actually come up with the cash to get it done? This is not going to be a $2 million deal, no matter what we talk about. And, and if, Tearing and if it I down mean, is going to be $2 million, so we don't want to do that. But, you know, this is, there's a lot of money going to be involved here. And I just think town council should, could help the community understand what process we have to follow. That way we don't have the message concerns that, you know, it's, I can already see. I'm going, to get some, I'm going to get some feedback on the fields this weekend <laughs> based on the meeting tonight so far. And if I may, through the chair, what, I'm, what I was asking for is a generic 
practicality. Like you were saying, you want to look into here and see what the configurations, what people are looking for. I'm not even thinking about it even at that level. Just a generic refit of a of a 1929 building, a 1980s building, a 1950s building, it, you know, it, it, what's the uh, the again? Where we were, th they were at 30,000 feet. At 10,000 feet, first look at it and then see if it's if it's worth investing again at the thousand foot level, where we're starting to talk about the individual um, groups that want to use in specific areas and and that to make it. Uh, uh, the, the, you know, a deeper feasibility study. I guess it depends on what you're going to do with the information that we provide you. We, we'll come back to you and say, yes, we can fit X, Y, and Z in there, and it's going to cost, you know, Z, Z million dollars. Um, what are you going to do with that decision? Are you going to base if your decision to keep the building or sell the building based on that number? Because if you are, we can't do it on $5,000. For $5,000, we're going to give you a very generic answer and it's not going to give you the information you need to really make a decision of that magnitude. Well, if, if I may again through the chair to clarify maybe what I'm, the, you know, in order to make the, the building um, up to up to the, what, what are we at, at 2009 building standards, you know, to meet, the, meet ADA requirements for, 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 the, for, the, uh, for the new building codes. Um, to to make it uh, insulated, to, to, you know. I'm just talking about uh, just to the, a basic refit for and for a 1929. Was it 80,000 square feet uh, total? 55,000. 55,000 square feet for a 55,000 square foot building, you know. To to make it, you know, what 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 are those basic costs first? We might be able to do that for 5K, and then we can th then then if you come back and say. You know, 35 million, 40 million, or 15, whatever the number is, then that at least gives the gives people a, a chance to start start thinking about, okay, how much do we love it? You know, the same thing when you get a when you you know to get a, your house repaired or or, or or to get an antique car built re, uh, redone or something. In in fact, through the chair. That's why I the said work. The yeah. The work that Mr. Cortina is describing has already been done. How so? Through the, based on discussions that the town manager was having with the Board of Selectmen on several properties in town, uh, and also looking forward to our transitioning back to town hall, uh, we, we did enlist the services of an architectural firm that did a preliminary estimate answering the questions that Mr. Cortino has raised. And that, that report can be shared with the Permanent Building Committee. Oh, okay. Mr. Kamal. Is that where the 12 to $16 million number came from in the reuse report? 12 to 16, <coughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. 12 to 16 million? Right. Yeah. For the front building? All three. All three. Well, may, may I ask, when we were looking at that structure for a possible town hall use, were they looking at trying to reconfigure and work with the existing interior structure, or was, was that also included because one possibility of this would be, for instance, for the, for the 29 building, would be to just take everything out and then put in an interior structure to meet what you need, which is different than trying to just work with the existing classrooms. Were they looking at a gut or just work with what there's, is there and improve it? It was a combination of both. Okay. There are sections that, of the building that could be improved upon and should be preserved. Uh, and there were sections of the building that were identified that needed to be gutted. Mm -hmm. Because I know just even in just, you know, informal discussions that we had on the committee, there were a lot of, you know, first you looked at just what the t identified town space needs are for the different boards and committees that we'd like to try to meet within that structure somewhere. But there were a whole lot of different options for how you could get there, whether it was, you know, deal with all three buildings, take the middle building down, um, you know, completely gut the 29 one and then recon re reconstruct the interior to meet your needs. Um, you know, there were a lot of, a number of different ways so you know you might want to look at 
how to meet those needs. Right, and when, when we come back to you with our creatively. report, I'm expecting to get those type of questions and I want to be able to answer them. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and I don't think I can with $5,000. Keeps <laughs> coming back to my five grand. <laughs> it's all my fault. He shouldn't have said it. <laughs> but, but I know the team, you know, and this is just one option, but this was an option that was used for a lot of the forums, which seemed to go down well with the public, was not to be too hung up on that middle, that middle section, which is probably the neediest, that, right. you know, maybe you're looking at two buildings and then you meet your parking needs and whatever. So I just don't want to get, you know, I don't want, wouldn't want the board to spend an inordinate amount of time on an entire rehab if right from the outset looking at the spatial needs um, you know the initial viewpoint is that we're not necessarily saying that those needs need all three buildings if you will right you know two buildings yep. is a whole different kettle of fish than but the those, middle those one. are the type of things we look at if we if right we tore down the middle one right we could look at the feasibility of having two separate buildings and two separate elevators, two separate heating plants, yep. those type of things that would have to take into consideration. Right. If I may do the chair, so what do you think is a reasonable figure to put away to do a, do a study? Let, let's put money aside for a minute. Oh, okay. uh, Politician. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the reuse committee recommended a, a number of things to go in that building or buildings. They've, they've got the school administration, they've got parks and rec, they've got the information technology, youth and family services, the school's life skill program, um, the youth, youth community center, recreation gym. That's, that's a lot to go in there. Even if some doubled up, I mean, that's a possibility. So I, I think we'd like to get some sort of prioritization between the selectmen or the reuse committee on what's really important so we know when we start to program this thing, which ones that we can drop out when we find out that we don't have enough space for everything there. Do we, do we, any, do we prioritize any of those? Mr. Flannery? I, I, I don't think we prioritized any of them. Uh, I think the, I think in, I'll speak for the team, um, certainly team members here can correct me, but I think we were looking at it from the standpoint of these are needs that residents of the town have expressed to us, as well as um, the internal um, polling of the uh, town departments, boards and committees that were at the top of the list that they always kept coming up those, the, the, the school administration offices, town offices, parks and recreation were all at the top. Ultimately, we felt as a team that that prioritization shouldn't be ours to decide, it should be um, the more professional studies done by some group like the Permanent Building Committee in conjunction with the board and the town manager's office to determine what best fits in there. <coughs> when your recommendation goes before the board, they can look at it and decide if that is in, um, in uh, accordance of, with their vision of what that building should be going for. I mean, these needs are all existing needs that are not being met now, but you know, whether you look at it from the standpoint of we have to meet these needs and it's got to fit in that building, so now we've got to find a way to make them fit, and that's when maybe you get into the, oh, now we're going to have to keep the, whatever is it, 50s, 60s edition, or maybe you look at it from the other aspect is what is financially feasible, reasonable. And, you know, maybe you end up with two buildings and then you say, well, we just can't fit all that stuff in. And so we're going to have to make priorities that, you know, we can't meet this board's need, that board. You know, I, I'm not sure from what came out from those studies that those are all needs that we're saying absolutely we have to have in that building. It was just more uh, a, a view of how many town needs there are that, okay. ne that need space. But I wouldn't... I don't think that you should be constrained by every single one of those town needs. I would prefer you to yeah. take, a, take a look at the building and the cost and say what's reasonable for the town, and then we'll just see what we can work within. And, and if that. I may, through the chair, can I throw one more out of the box thing? <clears throat> Is just refurbing the, the um, 1929 section. 
and what's the cost of, of just building a whole new gym? Because in some, in some aspects, that might actually be less expensive than to repair and, and refit, refit the old one. Looking at some of the rebuild costs of, of, of what a gymnasium costs to build, we, it may actually be cheaper to just um, save the, and then put, the, put another gym behind it, a, a brand new one. But clean up the 80s. And just well take out take out it, it, it seems like everybody's everybody's nostalgic about the old section. No 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 the gym and then the 80s classrooms you keep yes, clean, you know, up you know, clean up those clean up those take everything yeah. right out and you know because if that's what people keep asking for the gym the gym the gym for a rec area but to to redo that the heating systems and everything else and 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 and, and um, uh, restrengthening the walls and the, and the foundation where the cracks are and all that stuff. Um, it may be less expensive to make a make level up the whole area and put in a whole another gym. Just just throwing that out there. Yeah. But not take away the '80s. The '80s is is fairly new. Just yeah, clean no. that up. Well, You're talking and, about the again, gym I, again. If it if it costs more money to redo the '80s than if than if we don't need this if we don't need the space. The six six classrooms. Oh, we have okay. Well, I'm just I'm just throwing that out there. Yeah. Because right. people keep saying knock down the center section. Mr. Wisemantle, can, can you yes. add something? As Vice Chairman of the Committee, I've read the architect's report that did the study for our town manager. All the questions you just asked were answered in that report. Okay. He's got numbers for rehabbing each section. In fact, he's got a study where he fit all the town hall into the whole building, keeping the 50s section. So all these numbers are there, all are relative costs, which a caution that these aren't construction estimates because he's doing a relative cost based on other projects he's done around the, the Commonwealth. But all these questions you've asked are kind of there. I caution everyone on the 50 section. I'm not in love with that, but I also like to keep Town Hall. So if you don't put all of Town Hall over there, you can get rid of the 50 section and meet all the needs that we put in the, in the report. Okay. So I. I would suggest you all read the report. It'll educate you and get you at a much better level than where you are today. And 90% of the questions you've just asked, which are all great questions, Good. have already been answered. Good, okay. That's, that was part of my concern that the stuff was not relevant because it was answering a different question, but you're saying it is, so that's, that's great. Mr. Kamala? In fact, building on that point, now that it is clear um, now that we are clear on the purpose of the feasibility study, I respectfully suggest that perhaps you assign the town manager uh, to uh, work with the permanent building committee uh, in reviewing the report that was put together preliminarily by the architects uh, and see if there are ways of at least using the existing information to answer the questions that have been raised by the board in addition, if there's additional work that would need to be done for us then to decide what's the best way uh, to, to get that work done. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a good first step to see that report. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure Mr. Kamala could keep you at $5,000. <laughs> <laughs> that's the question. How much did that report cost? And, and <coughs> while doing that, and, and while doing that, I think we need a, a process from town council about how this would play out. Yep. Because we're talking about kind of buying a building, but not really, because we already got the building, we got the land, but the cost is gonna be like buying a new building or building a new building, if not more, because we're saving something. It's more expensive to mm -hmm. save the front of that building than to tear it down and build a new one. That's the, I don't wanna do that, but that's a, that's a fact. So we got to figure all that out, and we need to have a process to figure that out too. I think that's really important in this whole discussion, and it's kind of outside sort of the, the nuts and bolts of the building itself and the work, but if we can't figure that out, nothing's going to happen because it'll be difficult at town meeting to get everyone to understand what we're doing. Yeah, that's for sure. Well, do, you, do we think does Mr. Kamala think, does the Permit Building Committee think that we could get enough groundwork done, that we could get a, a sense of the actual cost for a, an adequate feasibility study to put a capital article well, on that's the... That's what I'm uh, saying. That's what we need to understand. On, on the I think I mean, that's between how it's going to play out. Yeah. When is that open? 
February, yeah. March. I think that's how it'll. I mean, there's going to be some money needed, but you can't you can't put on you can't go to town meeting for money to do the actual construction until we first have a, an adequately professionally done study. But we could we could have a capital article or free cash or whatever if, if we could get that up by February March. That's what I'm not clear how we would, the process we would follow. Like I get if we're building a new school, it's MSNBA. It's right. these guys. It's, you know, there's a whole process that's very clear. But for this. It's kind of the same magnitude in some respects. I certainly like the library magnitude anyway. Uh, but what's the process? I don't know. And I think that's where we have to go eventually, probably. Right. But let's understand that first. And, uh, and if I may, are the grants available for staving an old building and reusing it for something like that? There might be. Oh, we have right a great guy. I mean, we, we've had <laughs> we had some grant money from Mass Historic that did some of the rehab for Town Hall. Mm -hmm. The CPC funds that might be able to be used, you know, yeah, there but, are you know, other things you add that helps, up. But, but yeah. again, to, to Brian's point, we have to make sure that first we're going to know. Right, we, we, we are we're going to know the what the ask is first. Could so, yeah. MESS do that? MESS do that? What's that? Could MESS do a feasibility study? <laughs> <laughs> Pro bono. Okay. But it, it, oh, it sounds very similar to what we did with the DPW. We did a number of feasibility studies on. Well, and then we looked at location as well, but on, on how we could build that building on that site, different configurations, and come up with what we felt was a was a reasonable cost estimate that we could go to town meeting and ask for that money. Um, but it didn't it didn't happen quick. Well, what about rehab in the old building at DPW? Huh. Had you ever been in it? <laughs> well, it's perhaps, a nice old building. Yeah. <laughs> it was great. Perhaps if we get the ball rolling. <laughs> You may get a better sense of what we need I and what the so. steps are, but I think you have to, you know, the big ship can't be steered until it starts to move. We need, yeah, we need to I get wanna, some I don't want to throw out a number of what we think we might need for a feasibility study tonight. Until you, you start to look at it. Let us proceed, so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's, yeah. let's move the ball kind of slowly and try to figure out what that is, and then we can come back to you right. after we've seen the architect's report uh, and, and give you a better update on what you think the next step. And we can even work on what that process is. We can work with Norman to figure out what that process is so we can come back and educate everybody on that. Yeah, on that. Now I yeah, saw good. Mr. Dubinsky had a remark in the back. Yes, I just, uh, Bob Dubinsky, Park and Rec, uh, member of a liaison to the uh, reuse committee. I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank the town manager, Dave Vittorio, and you folks for allowing us to continue our programming in the gym. Uh, a lot of the townspeople are still able to use that facility and expanding that to the, uh, the classrooms as well for temporary meeting space, which is one of the things that the group had, uh, group had discovered there was a big need for. So any cooperation that you need from us as you continue to cooperate with Park and Rec, thank you. Thank you very much. So in the interest of time, uh, I think the first one we need to do is simply to um, ask the, uh, the PBC to take on the charge studying this um, what other things do we need to be asking in our motion you might oh, that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wasn't it to, yeah to have um, mr. Kamala work with the PBC to uh, correct study and the folks and figures in the process of, along with town council right Oops, squeaking <laughs> All right, would someone like to offer a motion um, based on our discussions? We can amend it if needs be. So I'll move that the Board of Selectmen uh, authorize the Permanent Building Committee to uh, a request that the Permanent Building Committee uh, work with the town manager who is authorized by this motion to we request with our colleagues right uh, to work with uh, and coordinate um, or not to work with to coordinate uh, understanding the process and the dollar amount required for a full feasibility study of the center school site and building and that uh, the Permanent Building Committee and the Town Manager's Office work with Town Council, and I keep emphasizing Town Council here, and 
and it seemed like the only one saying it, but work with town council to understand the process to bring a possible project to the town meeting uh, in the spring of, or, or a possible pro, pro project or feasibility for a project to town meeting uh, in the spring of 2019. Does that make sense? Motion sound good, Mr. Kamalu? Yes. Two. Yeah, I, I think it is. Okay. I'll second. second. So Dan, does that work for you for your committee? Yeah, I think I think that encompasses enough. It's pretty broad intentionally. Yeah, but, um, and I think that addresses sort of this whole message concern that I've had that or heard about that five of you don't make this decision this big. That's you know and I say of course and they say, Well, let's just make sure it's that way. So could we hear that motion? Please. Good luck. Yeah. Good luck. At the Board of Selectmen requests that um, the PBC work with the town manager who is authorized to coordinate um, with the PBC to understand the process and the dollar amount required for a full feasibility study of the center school, center school site and building. And that the PBC and the town manager's office work with town council to understand the process to bring a possible project to town meeting in the spring of 2019 for a possible project or a feasibility for a project. Long motion. Oh, good one. I think well, you've got to like word for word. Because <laughs> <laughs> it sounds kind of rambling and whatever. <laughs> yeah. And that was seconded, seconded right? Yeah. Okay, Be Charlie. before we vote on it, um, all the members of the PBC are here. Um, I know the captain is the guy in charge here, but I would like to just turn to the other members and ask if they have any uh, questions or comments or input um, on what's been discussed so far. Gentlemen. My sense is that you're, that the path you're proposing is the right path. We ultimately need a full feasibility study to understand the cost, understand which program fits where best, and determine how you can use the town funding. You good? Anything I'd, I'd suggest adding to the motion is that somebody from the, we, the representative from the committee that actually did the work. The reuse team. Be part of that to make sure that we're not reinventing the wheel as we're looking at these issues. Do you mean the reuse team or? The reuse team. And a number of them on to us or, or whatever, only because right into the discussion. They're, they're more intimate with the, the process they went through. You wouldn't mm -hmm. have 20 meetings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it would be helpful to have them. Do you want to pick your? Do you want to pick your own your own person, or do you want one of them to uh, someone to volunteer? Hand up? <laughs> I don't know, they probably get a couple know, right here. Neither one's putting the hand, the hand up too quick. We, we don't have to put them on the spot tonight. We can, we can <laughs> <laughs> Does that need to be a motion? Does that person ever no. by chance be a police officer? The motion. I think yeah. that can be just a recommendation that a liaison from the center school team uh, be, be included in the discussions, perhaps. Yes. Just understood. Okay. We're good, Mr. Mr. Marlowe? I think that's fair, and in fact, I was going to suggest that when we sit down with the Permanent Building Committee, the Permanent Building Committee is going to define a process for making this work, and obviously that will include consulting with the advisory team. Okay. Okay, having said that, um, the motion is on the table. It has been seconded. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Aye, aye and opposed. It is unanimous. Dan, I hope you're willing to take on the charge. No, <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Thank, Thank you, everybody. All that Thank time you, you have. Thank you. <laughs> well put. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, I think we're, we're yeah. it's, this is going to be a little slow to start for various reasons, but I think we're, we're on the right path. I think we're on the path to save the building, too, which is the most important thing here, just how we do this is 
Try to figure out the process. It's gonna be a start good. the process. There's gonna be three steps forward and two back for a while here. Yeah. Yeah. Just the way it is. And, and I think yeah. a part of it was to, to to Norman's point, what is the building? Yeah. Right. right, right. Define the building. The building, it, and it might is, be Is it just the old part? Is it the old part in the, in the, yeah. the semi-old part, or the old part in the sort of new part, the yeah. old part the sort of new part? And, and, and let's not get hamstrung by looking at this whole thing. You know, be free to think creatively about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, okay, um, finally, we have a joint, uh, oh, excuse me, we've done the, this one, uh, Trails, Trails Authority. The Board of Selectmen will, recon will reconsider staff recommendations establishing a process and a structure for proposing, approving, managing, and funding town trails in Hopkinton. Um, and I know that Mr. Kamalo sent out only today some suggestions that had been pulled together. Uh, they're quite lengthy. Um, Mr. Lagoy also provided us with a great comparative study of a number of communities um, to give us a sense of what other towns are doing, how they're managing various issues, which is really, really valuable. I did have time to look at it and really appreciate having that. Um, but, you know, Mr. Kamalo and Lane, I think, are going to just give us an overview. Um, the board needs to look at it more closely. It's quite lengthy. Um, I was totally blown away when I first looked at it till I looked back over Norman's email and recognized that he basically said, this is everything but the kitchen sink. It doesn't mean we have to do all these things. We just threw everything in because I, for one, said, oh my gosh, I would never sign up for that board. <laughs> it was terrifying. Um, but Mr. Kamala, tell, tell us what you've got so far and let's kick it around a little. Yeah, uh, through the chair, a couple of things need to be said. First of, first of um, this is a topic that has received a tremendous uh, and high quality input from different town entities, uh, beginning with the uh, letter uh, and, and suggested charge that was submitted by the Upper Charles Trails Committee. Uh, we also have been in conversations with um, uh, Peter Lagoy's team that did a fantastic job compiling information from comparative uh, uh, towns. Uh, uh, thirdly, we also had a very good meeting with uh, Mike Bolson, um, the individual who is the spark plug behind maintaining trails and uh, trails uh, in, in, in town. So again, this is a topic that has received tremendous interest and high quality support um, from different entities in town. What we suggested to the board, uh, as the chair stated, is the full menu of what the board may consider in answering some of the questions that have, that have come up uh, over, the, over the years. Uh, let me begin by uh, uh, talking about the purpose, uh, and, and, and I'm walking you through the document that I shared with the board this, 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 this morning. Um, when we were looking at the purpose, we specifically wanted to identify the overarching goals um, that the board could pursue in looking at this matter. The first being, there are several questions that have come up to the board I'll get it. <laughs> and also to town hall regarding trails. And we understand that given the fact that we have different entities in town that handle trail issues. Um, we have entities that are focusing on specific projects like the Upper Charles Trails Committee. Uh, we have private non-town trail organizations. Uh, we also have through different regulatory processes in town um, um, have identified and created trails. And thus, the idea is is this the opportunity to create a one-stop shop that will address trail issues? The decision for the board is if that's the way to go, decide on the scope and charge uh, for that entity, uh, decide also on whether the entity will be providing recommendations and advice to the board of selectmen. 
um, I, in, 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 in arriving at this question, I did consider and, and, and landed uh, a, a great amount of work on this. We did consider the fact that uh, various town entities control and manage parcels on which trails exist. You have okay. the Conservation Commission. Um, you also have the Open Space and Preservation Commission. Uh, you have the Park and Rec Commission, uh, as well as uh, trails that may be on land that is under CR, and most of our CR, CRs, conservation restrictions, are held by HALT mm -hmm. and other entities. So the idea again here is in terms of an overarching purpose, uh, identify a committee that will become the one-stop shop for all matters regarding trails, and, whether, and the board will need to decide on whether that committee would be advisory in nature or will report directly to the Board of Selectmen as the chief elected board, or will report separately to the different entities that I've identified. And then second issue we, we considered was the fact that we have had different organizations and entities create trails as community assets on the ground. Uh, the public tra trails, private trails, all created differently, and thus, we need an entity that then builds a common vision around this asset. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, as we all know, there are different users on trails, and thus questions, issues, conflicts, and opportunities or desires to share knowledge does exist, and therefore, well, the board may look into creating an entity that will now uh, focus on reconciling the, conf the conflicting interests, uh, whether it's in terms of the users of the trails or it's in terms of impacts. Trails exist within a specific environment. They are neighbors, they are uh, um, um, uh, natural resources uh, that the town or the community may want to protect. And then also, nothing one way of addressing sustainability is to make sure that you have a structure uh, that, 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 that addresses uh, all methods regarding trails. And thus, uh, part of one of the overarching goals um, uh, in terms of purpose is to uh, define a governance structure uh, that would therefore institutionalize trail management, trail planning, trail development as part of our local government and community building process. And also because we have different entities that have an interest in, in, in trails, it's important to have an entity that will then act as a liaison between all these different entries, e e e entities. For example, the Upper Charles Trails Committee has a specific charge to complete a trail that connects from uh, the Milford uh, town line through the town to the Ashland town line. They are going to continue to do that work. Um, we also, as I said, have trails that are on, 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 on private land. There are trails that have been created through the town meeting process that may not be connected to the Upper Charles Trails Committee. Uh, and, and so you, we need an entity that will act as a liaison between the Board of Selectmen and every other stakeholder uh, in this process. It's important to have a, a purpose, uh, but the purpose cannot take you to the next level where you achieve your aspirations if you don't have specific goals. And therefore, goals for such an entity could be, as I said earlier, have a, a, a single point of reference for groups that are working on trails. Uh, the, the, the town has always emphasized process. We need processes in town that are user friendly. We need processes that are open and transparent and accessible to all. And so that should be one of the goals for this process. We need to establish a brand. We have high quality trails in town. I've been on most of the trails and clearly trails are part of our branding. I'm reminded of one instance where I visited a new resident in town uh, and as, as we were talking as to why they came, they chose Hoppington as, 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 as a place to live. Uh, one of the reasons was that they moved out of Boston uh, to, this, to, to, to this community because of the town trails. They can walk their dog, they can work with their family, 
and they can also they also invite other people from out of town uh, to come and enjoy this wonderful asset in the community. Um, and, and so clearly, trails are part of our branding. Fostering community engagement, we have seen some of the conversations that have been escalated to the Board of Selectmen, where clearly the community uh, is looking for opportunities to have their voices heard, their suggestions heard, their concerns addressed. And also sustainability. Uh, sustainability is part and parcel of our values and um, uh, clearly uh, I think one of the goals for this uh, entity would be to make sure that whatever projects move forward are, are, are sustainable. And then we have to comply with town plans, um, regulations uh, and rules uh, and we have seen some of the conversations that have been brought to the, the, the board's attention. For example, there were questions regarding whether parking provided meets with the, uh, meets the regulations and guidelines for establishing parking. Uh, we have had questions that uh, ask whether in building um, some of the bridges uh, for our trails, whether we've complied with the uh, Conservation Commission regulations. Uh, and finally, uh, I, because, because the work of this committee would be advisory in nature. Um, we are suggesting that one of the objectives is to make sure that the, the, the committee or the entity uh, that moves forward does not have any policy making authority. Uh, and that at least most of the discussions are escalated to the chief elected board in town. Specific duties, I gave you everything. <laughs> you did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, stretching from, uh, you know, designing, developing, managing trails to uh, actually de uh, developing standards uh, for, for the trails. And clearly this process will require consultations with the Planning Board, Conservation Commission, and other entities in town. Uh, and then finally, our, our outline touches on the project approval process as well as resources required. This is a very interesting topic in terms of what is the what is the process that the town can put in place um, to move forward the discussion on trails. Um, I think the following are important. Number one, as I said, it's important that the trails group coordinates with the planning board and the conservation commission in defining the standards for siting and designing trails. Uh, number two, it's important to con to continue to assure. Um, the residents that when, when trail projects move forward that we will comply and will comply with the town's regulations and permits that are required will be sought uh, and, and discussed in, in public. Um, it's also important uh, that we, we, we identify work that needs to be done without permits. For example, I've had Mike in the office working with Elaine on uh, projects uh, such as clearing brush, uh, blazing, uh, tree pruning, maintenance of erosion control structures. Let's find a way to exempt those uh, tasks and, and, and ensure efficiencies in terms of when they need to be done, they get done. Um, coordination with private landowners, I think that's very important. <coughs> it, that has to be part of the process for, for approving trail projects. And then um, I've also offered that there are private trails, trails that are created uh, outside town processes or town entities. Uh, we will need to define uh, a, a process for, for those projects. Um, my suggestion is that whatever group is put in place should make a finding on those projects and then report to the select plan. Uh, some of these projects may not require any town board, um, any review by a town board or commission. However, by the end of the day, if we're looking at creating uh, a, a common trail system, it's important that we share information. And then um, there's a question regarding trails or carrying on land that is controlled by other town entities. Usually we would like those entities to make the final decision. Uh, and thus, what we're, prepared, well, what we're presenting is that when those proposals are made to the entity controlling any parcel in town, that that decision be final. 
um, uh, and this is also consistent with uh, some issues that have come up, i.e. where a town meeting has decided on investing on a particular trail, uh, we don't want this process to be used to undo a town meeting vote without going through a town meeting. Mm -hmm. um, we also um, want to make sure that, and this is based on some of the questions that we've received, we want to make sure that following approval of any trail that we have town, town staff continue to participate in the construction and implementation to make sure that the construction is per the plans that are approved by the town. Um, there's also the issue regarding resolving complaints and concerns. I'm suggesting that we may not have an immediate answer to that question. And therefore, one way to address this issue is to, is to um, perhaps charge the entity that will um, focus on trails with developing a process for resolving complaints and concerns that are raised by neighbors. Resources, clearly, um, this work would not be done without volunteers. We need a formal structure where the town creates some group to focus on trails. This could be a five-member board or any number of, uh, any, 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 any number of uh, um, positions that the board deems necessary. Um, clearly, the work that we have seen requires coordination with staff. We'll need to find a way to identify some staff person in a town hall to support the work of this group. And then finally, we have to comply with procurement laws and um, Thus, we're suggesting that consultants for projects on trails will be appointed by the town manager as the chief, as the town's chief procurement officer. So, in a nutshell, that's what we're putting forth in terms of purpose, to big goals, work to be done, and processes that need to be in place to resolve some of the issues that have come forth uh, to this board for discussion. That was so succinct. <laughs> How about establishing a budget? for maintenance and develop, development and maintenance yeah, equipment. That's, 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 it's that's time we spend some money on our trails in Hopkinton. Yep. Annually, it's part I of our... I, I, I can't believe uh, that, that um, Mr. Bolston has, and, and, and the volunteers have done such a great job keeping them up that people actually think that we have a budget to take care of our trails, and, and, and we don't. And this is something that I've been asking for, for for a few years now, as you know, and it keeps getting dropped from the budget at the last minute. But, uh, I think the fundamental question as we try to move some sort of centralized <clears throat> oversight forward is does that centralized oversight authority have decision making power or is it advisory and we still have the decision making power? I mean, that's kind of the ultimate question here. Um, I think we're going to need a budget. We're gonna, if we want to do this right, we need some money and we need, we need management controls. And that's kind of what we're talking about for all, all of it. <laughs> How we get there, I mean, there's a lot of work to be done, and I'm sure Mr. Kamal and, and, and Elaine and others will, will get it done. Um, but really, from, I think from our perspective is, you know, to what level do we want to wash our hands of this, or not wash our hands, but turn it over to others? Uh, or do we want to hang on to the final decision making, like we're doing with the Upper Charles Trail? I mean, they do a ton of work, and they're dedicating a great number of volunteer hours. To them, but we still have the decision making authority. Perfect. If I may do the chair, I think that's a perfect example. You know, where we we help them with the with the policy, and and or the same way with the marathon fund. They they vet out the stuff, and then the, the stuff comes to us. If, if it comes to signing off money to to um, buy something or do something, they just come to us, and they've already vetted it through the uh, through mm -hmm. their committee, and then uh, it's presented to us, and we decide whether or not it's uh, worthy. Mm -hmm. Well, I had some, you know, early observations as I read this through, um, and I and I recognize I was actually relieved when Mr. Kamala said, "Look, I'm, you know, I'm giving you the full Monty. It doesn't necessarily mean we're doing all this stuff." A um, couple things that stood out to me is one, I want to recognize that we have some excellent, excellent volunteers and excellent work that's done in this town by these different committees and some of this stuff is complicated and they're doing it, they're doing it every day um, and I don't want to diminish that 
I don't want to lose that. I am always in favor of volunteer work. I'm always in favor of um, keeping valuable resources and building on them. But I don't want to either throw the baby out with the bathwater or lose the good work and the expertise that's being done by these entities already. Um, they know this subject intimately. There's a lot of groundwork, no pun intended, that's already been done in these areas. So I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel here. But what I heard and where, why I think we are taking this up now is there was a feeling on a lot of people that with all these different entities, there was a lack of coordination um, a lack of transparency, perhaps not intentional, but just you had the right hand not always knowing what the left hand is doing. No, there was no clear lines of reporting or authority. People, if they had a concern, weren't sure who to go to or who could have decision-making capacity. Um, and, and I do think that the idea of visioning, of a master plan, of an overall vision that everybody can look at and see, um, meets this need for transparency. Uh, when I looked at some of the work that Peter Legoy did surveying some of the other communities, in a lot of cases, you know, the selectmen doesn't, don't need to get too deep into the weeds, and we shouldn't be having all these small, you know, things for adjudication brought to us. These should be handled at lower levels, and, you know, the selectmen get involved if it's, as, as his document referred to, it's a global level. Um, but in more, more cases than not, these different entities dealt with it as best they could, and if not, then it got kicked up to a higher level. Uh, so I would like to see something where we, and I don't want to add town costs either, that's another thing. We've done great stuff with volunteerism, and we can continue to do that as much as possible. I would like to see something where we build on the existing expertise of existing groups that are already doing this, and we have it under a consistent whole, a committee that doesn't necessarily do the, the um, down and dirty, but we have a consistent system, we have a consistent marking pit, um, method, we have a vision that the town can see as a whole, um, and when issues are not, we have some policies, when issues cannot be resolved at the immediate level, it goes to this committee, and then if in those rare, hopefully rare instances where something really is intractable, it comes up to this board. Um, but I just think there needs to be a system for coordination and transparency, um, really using and valuing the great wealth of expertise and ability that we already have because the kind of stuff that gets done, the amount of time that's put in, I think you'd be hard pressed to reinvent a whole new committee of people that either have the ability or the time or the, or the enthusiasm to do what some of these groups are already doing. So I want to improve upon it, but I don't want, I don't want to reinvent things. But that's So, so I would suggest that we create a new committee the Hopkinton Trails Committee, appointed by the Hopkinton Board of Selectmen, and that Hopkinton Trails Committee be seven people. I'm just throwing out numbers here. And those seven people, one comes from the Upper Charles Trails Committee, one comes from the, I don't know all the different entities in town. Open space. We, open space. One comes from the, the, the Trails Club. I mean, that's just a club of people, but they know who they are, and we reach out to them and appoint one of them. So we build a committee of one, meaning one committee, mm -hmm. that takes in that expertise that you're describing and makes that one committee the authority over all the other activities of the trails in town. Yeah. I do think, however, that that committee needs to have a budget. I think yeah. it is time we create a budget in Hopkinton, a line item in the budget for trail maintenance uh, and development. Yeah. Um, mostly maintenance and maybe development can be separate and we could do separate articles if, if, that, if need be. But I, I, I think a single committee made up of experts from the various other committees is the way to go forward and, enhance, and, and enact a lot of the stuff that's on that list, obviously with the town manager working to set this whole thing up. But as an overarching committee, I still would like to see the individual committees or groups that have done such a good job 
can continue to be oh, they're going to keep doing their thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But bring them to an oversight committee to make sure that it all fits together. Yeah. Well, that's why we appoint one person from each committee. That, and that's right. what Mr. Kamala's. Right. But, we, but we keep those. So maybe those. we have five on there. They're one from each committee, depending on how many entities there are. And the people in the room could tell us how many entities there are. And then we have two at-large members who are just citizens that want to get involved in town government. Yeah, there seven, yes. There's something like that. Yeah, Mr. Kamala, if I may, to the chair, uh, Mr. Kamala had, had um, five down here. CONCOM, Parks and Rec, Planning Board, and then I believe that there was, those were three. And then, and then you were also um, Upper Charles. Upper Charles. And Trails Club. Trails Club. And the five. Open space. Open space. About HALT. Do we need HALT? No. <clears throat> I mean, who are, the, who are the key stakeholder groups around Trails and Hopkinton? I, we have the list. Right? I'll, I'll give you the list. Um, well, can we ask, can we ask Peter or, or some of you uh, guys that are out here that have done this for years? Yeah. yeah. Halt, yeah. Okay, so Halt 6. Yeah, and then at large. We need at least an at large. There's one at large. Come up here so they can see you at home. We gotta give other people a chance if they have other opinions. One thing I might suggest changing to um, what Brian was talking about is one of the issues we all get into, and you guys in particular, I'm not on many committees, so I'm lucky for that, but you know, <laughs> someone from, a con from CONCOM is appointed to, you know, has to be on six other committees. So what I would suggest is that um, rather than requiring the member to be from CONCOM, that CONCOM and each of these committees can appoint someone. Yeah, I think it said designate. Designate. That's fine. Exactly. Yeah. That's and fine. I, think I get what's it. What's really yeah. important with that is that that person designated <coughs> has an interest in trails and right. in developing, yeah. maintaining. Either a member of that committee or their designate. Designate. That's exactly. how we would yeah. word it. That makes sense. Good, yeah. good, good point. Oh, yeah. Good one. Yep. Yeah. But it's more important for that person to be active yeah, okay. and to have time available than to actually be. So do we have nine on? Not, if nine so nine, nine's seven. getting to be too many. I mean, this is. Seven's a good number. Seven's I a good like number. seven. Seven's a good number. So would we have this committee then create its own dispute resolutions and its own process for how we go about dealing with butter issues and everything? They, they vote everything like a public meeting. And when they can't make a decision or it turns into a political football and then they come here, people's throwing stuff at each other, then it comes here. But okay. Marathon Fund Committee, I mean, that was a great example. Yeah. Marathon Fund Committee is five people, I believe, and they have a budget, meaning we get a bunch of money in excess money from the BAA, from the marathon each year. So they know what they can do with that money to a certain extent. And they make all the decisions and they vet it all out and they get pricing and all that. And then they come to us and they show this form they fill out and they say, we want to do this and this is the price, please approve it. Mm -hmm. And we approve it. So it's two tiers of management oversight. So I, I think the same thing would be really effective for trails. Mm -hmm. yeah. in, in, in fact, <coughs> in the first instance, the group will recommend um, regulations, standards for adoption by the Board of Select. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So sense. we've been very fortunate so far for so long that we have people like this that are right. volunteering. But we can't always depend on these guys volunteering. And, and as, uh, as people drop off, there aren't always people that are willing to jump in and, and, uh, and help out. So, you know, we'd be foolish not to try to take advantage of these guys as much, and girls as much as we can, as quickly as we can and then get something up and running. So there is a cohesive unit that, that, every, that oversees everything and there's no gray area. And, um, but I think we need to do it post haste. I don't think we can drag our feet on this. Uh -huh. Every other community that we looked at had a trails committee. The reporting structure changed a little bit. It's different in different communities, but at the end of the day, sort of what you've been talking about here is kind of how that worked. It was, they were the one-stop shop, but then they, cooperated with town staff, with other committees in town, 
to make trails work. Uh, you know, in some cases, right. CONCOM owned the land where a trail was going, so they had to make that cooperation. And mm -hmm. the maintenance might be volunteer groups or a, a steward who's in charge of that process, but maybe in a bigger issue, DPW would come in and help out. So they, they all sort of had a general framework that worked and is consistent with kind of what you're talking about and what Norman's put together here. Look for other comments. I see Mr. Sauna had his hand up. Other people out in the audience as well. Eric. This is great that you're having this conversation. It truly is. The, uh, Sit there where they can hear you on the mic. Oh. Your voice doesn't carry. Your voice doesn't carry. <laughs> <laughs> He's a shy type. <laughs> you don't have a booming you voice. You've upgraded since my day. Uh, as vice chair of the Upper Charles Committee, we find ourselves in the same position that I find myself in on the Historic Committee Commission in that people don't understand uh, all the committees with the same name. For example, on the Historic Committee Commission. See, even you see, don't even, understand even the do. name. <laughs> on the Historic Commission, people think we're the Historic Society, they think we're the Historic District Commission, and all of that funnels helter-skelter. Yeah. The same thing is happening with trails. Upper Charles, every time there's a trails issue, the people come to Upper Charles because we're commonly referred to as the Trails Committee. You're visible, too. Right. Yeah. We're there. And we're official, which is a good thing. If I were in your position, I would look at how you've structured the Upper Charles Trails Committee with the same budgetary discretions and, and you've given Upper Charles a mission with guidelines on how to do it and you've maintained the final decisions uh, for the Board of Selectmen based on what we bring you. I would do the same thing with trails, have literally the same structure. Mm -hmm. Keep it simple. Mm -hmm. Don't go off in all kind of directions. Yeah. I think what Peter's done getting all this other town stuff is, is great because I want to see it. Maybe we can upgrade or change some things in Charles. Yeah. The issue, though, <laughs> is absolutely critical. The trails in this town are a major asset that are not being managed in a cohesive way. It's a helter-skelter thing. Mm -hmm. Guys like Mike Bolson and Peter and, and I, I could name, my God, so many people that are involved. Uh, even Tim Kildoff today is, is worried about a uh, cross-country thing behind the middle school. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's a major, major issue. The more structure you give to it, the more budget, the more direction to let them go do their thing, I think we'll all be rewarded from it. Transparency, too. Transparency. Trans well, yep. clearly. But direction and transparency. Give the direction to the committee of what your vision is and what they're charged with, and then let them do their thing. Yeah. There's enough talent, enough people to volunteer. As soon as you create that committee, you're going to have so many people want to get on it, you're not going to know what to do with them all. It, it, that's my opinion, but I've seen it in virtually every committee we've ever formed mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that uh, build it and they will come yep. and take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Mr. Sonnet being here representing Upper Charles is, you know, perfect example of my feeling about keeping the existing wonderful resources that we have, human resources, in place because you know, I had the privilege the other day of taking a field trip ride with Jane Moran through the Upper Charles and all the areas that are under consideration and the amount of knowledge and the amount of work that that one board has put in is amazing including all kinds of ongoing negotiations with various property owners and things you know that might or might not but these are relationships and and, and expertise that's been built over time and and we want to keep we, we don't need to start reinventing the wheel when we've got this, these valuable resources. We can build on it, but we should, uh, we should really value and continue to use what we have, and Upper Charles Trails 
is a perfect example. <laughs> so any, anything that we would put in place tonight is not etched in stone forever. No. So I think we could go ahead and get a motion on the table to create the Hopkinton Trails Oversight Committee um, and start to build what the charge is going to be and then we can come back in future meetings and tweak it as need be um, based on input from the folks that maybe get put on the committee, uh, based on input from the town manager, based on input we hear in the community, et cetera. But I, I, I'm of the thought that it's time to like put something in place, like make a motion. Uh my feeling, I don't know whether other members of the board had time to read all this document that was sent it just this morning. It's very lengthy, it's very involved. Um, I would rather take the smorgasbord approach rather than, as Mr. Kamalo described, eating the entire cow. <laughs> uh, I'd like to see this scale down to something that is simpler. And um, a lot of these tasks, I think, are already being done. And I, I don't think we need a committee to start doing some of this nitty gritty. It needs to be more of, as you described, more of an overarching committee. So um, what was put out today, I think, needs more than a tweak. I mean, we could or we could just create the entity in name and then flesh it out afterwards. Um, but I, I think we need something to vote on that's a little yeah, more I'm not, yeah, I'm not suggesting we'd finalize the charge tonight. I'm just suggesting we get it going. And I, I agree there's a lot of just detail in there. put the name there. out there. Uh, I'm glad you read it. I did not. Yeah, well, uh, I looked at it and said I'm not reading that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't need to read that, though, because my job is not to get into the nitty gritty. My job is to set the policy and the motion right. in place, I think, for Mr. Kamal and his team to then be successful. So, and I think they will be. So. I, I, I do think we could create the Hopkinton Trails Oversight Committee tonight. Uh, I do think we could name the number of people that would serve on that committee, which I believe seven is a good number. And I think we could name the various entities that will either appoint, uh, have a representative or appoint a designee to serve on that committee. And then that committee could then convene and that committee could then work with the town manager's office to begin to draft their view of the charge and then that would be the next step that we could take at this level is to confirm or affirm the charge that they create with the understanding that we're looking for a single authority to act like the Marathon Fund Committee and maintain the funds, maintain the trails, just like the Fund Committee does in the town of Hoppington and to bring forward to the Board of Selectmen for final approval, their recommendations to invest and maintain the trail, something like that. I mean, that's, that's all we got to do tonight, but that gets the ball rolling because we've been talking about this for a while. Well, with all respect, Mr. Herr, we're not going to start appointing anybody till we have a full fleshed out charge. Personally, I would feel more comfortable maybe waiting one more meeting and seeing if the next meeting we can have something that's scaled down and a bit, a bit more of, of an outline than what we've got today. I just. I would like to see something like one document that we're looking at. I think we at. can appoint people without having the charge worked out, but that would depend on our colleagues in a vote. Mr. Kamal. Yeah, if I, I may, through the chair. Um, I think putting the two concepts together, here's what you get. There is clear direction today that we're moving forward uh, considering creating a trails group. Uh -huh. So that, that, that is clear to us. What is also clear is the the scope of the charge that can be created uh, and so we we can quickly work on a charge i think what is also important is that we consult with other entities that are impacted by this discussion mm -hmm. uh, and, and i think it's always easier brian to have conversations with other entities um, if if we can make them feel that they are part of creating the charge so my suggestion is let's Fair point. Co combine the two ideas. There's clear direction and intent by the selectman that we keep moving forward. Yep. Uh, we will work on a draft charge, consult with everybody else, so that at least when we, we bring the charge to the selectman, we can say we've spoken with Conscom, we've spoken yeah. with Open Space, we've spoken with Planning Board, we've spoken. One, one other uh, constituency that we, we haven't mentioned so far are the private associations where, create, where trails have been created. Mm -hmm. I counted no less than 11 associations. Mm -hmm. um, so 
I think the, 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 the board's intent is clear. Uh, there's a process uh, and due diligence that we need to make, uh, and we can do that uh, as quickly as possible and come back to the board. So I would be okay with that. I feel better with that. And uh, my only caution would be that sounds like lots of weeks of chit chat and maybe months. And so then I'm concerned that we're just going to keep talking about this and revisit it three months from now or six months from now. <laughs> so that's my only concern with that. You just named a lot of people and a lot of personalities and a lot of opinions. So we got to be careful that we don't, we can't be afraid to make a decision because everybody doesn't get a chance to weigh in. But I think a reasonable time frame for people to weigh in once you let them know if they have an opinion, now's the time to share it. I'm okay with that. Okay. Mr. Sonnet. Why don't you form an interim committee of maybe the town manager and two or three people, maybe someone from Upper Charles, Peter, someone else, to look at the smorgasbord that Norman's come up with, prioritize it, and hopefully end up with something that's manageable and workable. Uh, yeah. You would still make the decision, yeah. but it would take that process from what could be months yeah. into weeks. That's a good idea. Yeah. I, 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 uh, again, I, I don't think the board needs to formally make that recommendation. Our intent is to quickly go back to the resources that we've been using, utilize your connections, your networks to coordinate the meetings with the other group. I really want this decision to be the selectman's decision. Sure. But Brian's right, though. I mean, you're, 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 you've, you've, got a, you've got something here that could expand exponentially in a waste of time. Yeah, always. So you can't let that happen, Norman. That's exactly. We, we will, I'll <laughs> okay. be asking for your help. <laughs> so we'll, go with, that we'll, we'll go with, yeah. with, with seven members or the designee, and we named, named the, uh, the seven groups. Well, Mr. Okay. Bolson. Well, I guess we're going to hold off doing that. Yeah, okay. Well, I just want to make sure that, that we we that we didn't just churn something again today. We've got a format on that right now with the upper you know, Charles. You know, it, but because you know, right now we just again to your point, all we did was churn it and we talked about it again. I've been doing this for three years now. Three years we talked. Three years ago we came up with this with this draft for a trails committee out of the upper Charles committee. And, and, and now we're going back, we're, we're coming up on January again. And I just, I, I don't want to lose it. I don't want to lose it, but, you know, we, uh, um, I don't Stay know how much it. more energy Mike Bolson has to keep cleaning the trails. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Bolson, uh, yes. Uh, Mike Bolson, tank on that. Um, it's hard to simplify. It's hard enough as it is, and now to simplify it is, we're not, there. I mean, we're, we're going to trim any fat. It's, um, it's taking time, a lot of time to get this far. And how can we simplify it? Well, I, I think what I was talking about when I mentioned simplify, <laughs> you haven't had the privilege of reading no. the document that Norman sent. It is everything but the kitchen sink, including to my interpretation, putting on this proposed committee a lot of the actual groundwork that is actually being done already. Um, and that's what I mean by simplify, that we can strip down a lot of this and say this is already being done. We just need a board that oversees and coordinates um, and, and, you know, is less, is less detail involved. Simplify the charge for the committee and leave a lot of the, the down and dirty work. Keep a lot of the day-to-day -day work in the hands of the existing yeah. groups that are doing that have the knowledge. But, but to say, what worries me is what Norman said. We're going to go back and we're going to ask Concom again. We're going to ask we're going to ask Parks and Rec again. We're going to ask the Planning Board again. We're going to ask Apple Charles again. And, and I don't know how, to, to Mr. Bolson's point, I don't know how many more times we can churn this, churn the same document. Uh, you know, if, if, if maybe we, 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 we give a charge, you know, and, and then and to Mr. Bolson's point, have the committee themselves say, well, you know, this, we, we, we really can't do this, we really can't do that. Um, I, I'm just worried about it. But but would you that, feel better if we said at time that we get this back on the next agenda and that, that night we're making decisions, at least to start, if we can't do it tonight? 
Would that be all right? I'd feel better about that. I, I, I didn't see from what Mr. Kamala says, maybe you have more, more you know, history of knowledge than I do. I didn't see that this was going to go off into space and go on forever, but just that we needed to hone this down, have a little clearer outline of what we're voting on, and send it to these other committees for comment is a courtesy because it impacts them. But I you know that they've been they've been contacted. Okay. Three years wow. ago, we started contacting these other committees. Okay. I put, the, the, the Trails Club has had input. The Upper Charles has had input. Concom has, everybody's had input to, into, into all, all of this. That's why it's so thick. You got a date for us, Mr. Kamal? Peter? Claire, one, one possible way of addressing this is I think, um, and what I, what I, you know, I, I put together a small, or Trails Club put together a small group, seven people, and we, yeah. we looked at a bunch of different towns, and um, what sort of fell out from that was, and some of it had to do with um, what Brian had tasked the town manager with doing, but really you're looking at development of trails, dealing with sort of general trail committee process issues, mm -hmm. and that includes dealing with the butters concerns. Yep. Yep. And then finally is maintenance. Mm -hmm. And maybe the thing to look at is coming up with a more general charge that kind of spells out those three things, but the specifics maybe is something that's for a later date. And, and we may not know all the specifics right at this point. That trails committee is, um, you know, to, to Eric's point, what we want is a trails committee that everyone knows to go when they have a trail issue, whatever that is. Right. If it's because the, the dogs are using the trail too much, they go to the trail committee as the you know, one-stop shop. Exactly. Yep. So that's really the key. And then maybe the charge is really down a little too much in the weeds at this point. And maybe you guys can be looking at saying, what's the overall policy we're looking at getting here? You know, at the broad brush, at the at the higher level and let the committee get in the, into the weeds. I, I, I agree, Peter, but in deference to the chair and to Mr. Kamal, they're looking for a little more time to get a little bit more detailed yeah. work done. And I'm okay with that, if, but I don't want this to, to Mr. Kamal. How much point. time? I don't I want this to go on. I want a date on a next, what, what, what agenda can we get this on? I know they're looking at the calendar over here, but they won't cough up a date just yet. We have the 13th and the 27th. Of? November. That quickly? So we prefer the 27th. <laughs> Smart man. <laughs> 13th it is. I'll be, I'll be good with we that. We prefer the 27th. At least it gives us enough time yes. to consult with If we want to board. table this until November 27th, yeah. and then. Do, do the 27th. But, but, in that time, reach out to those couple of other entities that you mentioned, should at least touch base with and say, we're going to decide, we're going to talk about this on the 27th. So speak now. And to our other board members who haven't had a chance to read through all this, just to get a sense, I would ask everybody to look at it so we I all understand. I don't need to read it. I get the whole thing that's in there we've been talking about for 10 years. I would like to put out there, though, that on the 27th, we're not going to talk about it again. We're going to put it on the agenda to vote to create. Mm -hmm. And maybe give more than 15 minutes on the agenda, because we are well over an hour overdue from our agenda right now. Well, I just didn't have 15 minutes. This did. I shouldn't have had 15 minutes. This did. 2.15 to 8.30. That's too short. Anyway, okay. All right. Are we comfortable putting it off that far and you guys fleshing this out a little bit better into something we can really take a vote on? We'll work on it. All right. Thank you. Excellent. Trails, trash, and trees. Here we go. Trees. Okay. <laughs> and Peter, thank you so much for this, this overview. Did. That was really helpful. Yep. Really, really helpful. Yeah, it was kind of... Uh, Every Yep. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. Okay. That went long, but it needed to be discussed. So uh, finally, we come to the town manager's report. Mr. Kamala, what do you have to share with us tonight? Um, expanding on the comment, I think, that was shared by uh, Bob Dibinski earlier. Uh, town staff is in conversations with uh, parks and recreation regarding uh, the current use of the gym as well as the potential to expand park and rec programming uh, to bring in um, 
outside entities as well as gain access to the classrooms. No decisions have been made at this point. We're exploring that opportunity. I, I would caution uh, the gym use is not changing. So building code was, I don't think, should be impacted necessarily about the gym use. But those classrooms, that use is changing. And I'd be very careful because that could be a significant liability for the community if something were to go wrong and we weren't fully lined up with state and federal law for use, change of use requirements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. That's part of the conversation. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Nothing more? Nothing more at this point. Okay. Good one. Uh, all right, then we will move to board uh, liaison reports and board invites. So I would like to talk uh, just for less than 30 seconds that the dedication to the DPW is this weekend, Saturday, 9 a.m. at the, obviously at the new DPW. Um, I'm definitely going to be going to that. 9 o'clock. 9 a.m. Okay. Zero nine hundred. Other members? I'll be there also. I just, uh, I, I, actually it's on a liaison report, I just want to rem remind uh, all the, uh, my uh, Mo Bros out there that it is Movember coming up. I cheated a little bit, started two days early because I didn't want to look like I just didn't shave today. But, um, you know, it's important to raise awareness of men's health issues, such as prostate cancer, men's suicide, and, and uh, testicular cancer. Um, the Movember Foundation runs uh, the Movember Charity Event, uh, and the goal of Movember is to change the face of men's health by encouraging men to uh, get involved. It aims to increase early cancer detection, diagnosis, and effective treatments, and ultimately reduce the number of preventable deaths. So uh, everybody um, get, get aware of your family history and uh, try and adopt a healthier lifestyle. Grow a stash. And grow a mustache. <laughs> Is it November like stash month? It's Movember, and it's Movember. Mo that's really good. For, Something for, for people years like years. me, that's like discriminatory. Right, yeah, guys, you can't please. grow a mustache. You look please. like Sidney Crosby in the playoffs. Hey. <laughs> One thing I'd like Fair to bring fun. up is um, this past week has been tragic. We've had two, yes. two shootings, um, and I just want to uh, put it out there that you know, from the board of selectmen, that our hearts and, and prayers are with uh, with the victims in Pittsburgh and Kentucky as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I just wanted to mention two things because we will, by the time we meet again, uh, Veterans Day will have come and pa come and gone. Uh, remind everyone of our annual Veterans Day ceremonies, which are held at the Senior Center, um, which will occur on Veterans Day, and also to draw attention to another very nice veterans event. Our Girl Scout troop is. Uh, running an event at the Hopkinton Library on November 10th at 2 p.m. and this is what it means to serve our country. It is a panel discussion with five of our Hopkinton veterans and it is moderated by our own uh, Ben Polico who is himself a veteran of the U.S. Navy. So a very nice, a very nice event honoring our veterans on November 10th at the library at 2 o'clock. Madam Chair, one more thing. We, um, early voting is going on here in Hopkinton, so remember everybody, um, midterm elections, get out there and vote, and vote before 8 p.m. on November 6th. It's 2 o'clock, Claire? It is 2 o'clock on November 10th at the Hopkinton Library, what it means to serve our country. Panel discussion with Hopkinton veterans, five Hopkinton veterans, and Ben. Future agenda items, anyone? Brian? I think we should talk about trails at some point in the <laughs> And no, and, and I, would I would like to uh, talk about trees <laughs> and tree trimming. And, and the uh, trash contract does And the DPW, get, I, I, we, we're still waiting to see the, uh, the uh, strategic plan from, um, for, oh, maybe oh, we'll, we'll, we'll be there on, on Saturday. I can ask the, uh, if you don't mind. I can ask the director of uh, of DPW because we're still waiting to see where that where the where trees fit in uh, before they, they they come up again and uh, start asking us if uh, what we're going to do about the uh, the limbs that are still falling down from the from last uh, spring and all that. We've got to get on that. 
So Saturday is kind of a focused event. No, I know I'm guys in trouble. I'm guys in trouble. Monday no, but but again, I, I've been I, I've been on this one for what about six months. I've been asking for this to get on the agenda. In in fact, through the chair on that point, um, we creatively identified a private partner, uh, and I'm going to be sending an email where several streets are going to be cleared in town at no cost to the taxpayer. So that so we'll we we'll, we'll get more information at a future meeting or something. In other words, boots on the ground. We're doing the work. Boots on the ground. Anyone else? Future items. We're all good. I have one thing I would like to bring up. Uh, we all received a very nice notice that at a recent veterans service conference, our Metro West Veterans Service district uh, was honored by receiving the Veterans District of the Year Award, which is a great honor for our service to veterans. And so I would, um, they were honored for outstanding service. And uh, Sarah Bateman is the Director of Veterans Services for the Metro West. I would like to schedule a time for Sarah to come in to tell us what the district does for the veterans and to honor her for our district getting this, this very outstanding honor for for excellent veteran services. So perhaps we can do that in the near future. All right, seeing no other items to be discussed, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Moved. Second. It's moved and seconded. All those in favor, please aye. say aye. 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 All right, thank you. And thank you. there are some things to sign right here. Don't go. Go to bed.